Good morning and welcome everyone to the 26th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. Our first agenda item this morning is to continue our scrutiny of the future relationship negotiations between the European Union and the UK Government. The Committee will take evidence from two panels of witnesses today representing sectors of the Scottish economy that are likely to be significantly impacted by the outcome of the future relationship negotiations. Can I welcome our first panel of witnesses to the meeting? They are Paul Sheeran, the Chief Executive of Scottish Engineering, and Rod McKenzie, the Managing Director of Policy and Public Affairs at the Road Haulage Association. Thank you for coming to give evidence uh, to us today, gentlemen. Um, I will uh, move immediately uh, to questions. Uh, could, could I open by asking if you have uh, the information uh, that you need uh, to proceed um, once Brexit kicks in? And in particular, do you have time to prepare for any no deal or low deal? And in particular, I wondered if you could comment on the Prime Minister's suggestion uh, last month that we were heading for an Australia-style agreement, uh, and whether you indeed have any uh, experience of trade with Australia, and if so, how you think that would impact if that was the the, the status of our deal with the European Union. Um, Mr Sheeran, do you want to go first? Okay. Um... I'm unmuted. So I think everyone can hear me. Oh, morning, everyone. Thanks very much for the invite today. I appreciate that. Um, so, to take up your questions, do, do everyone have the information available? Um, I suppose to answer that, uh, there's an awful lot of information out there. Um, there are still some gaps. Uh, I think, particularly um, around um, standards um, and. Uh, um, uh, harmonised uh, directive uh, responses for the for for the immediate future. Um, I've no doubt that there'll be uh, uh, some leeway in that, but it, it's something that takes a, a long time to prepare for. Um, and I think you know, from that point of view, I, I think I'd be better to to jump to the second question, which was, um, are we ready? Uh, given that first of January is looming large, and the short answer to that is not in the slightest. Uh, we are a long, long way away from that. And some of the things where detail has uh, crystallised this year, uh, for instance, glo UK Global Tariff uh, and uh, the UK uh, CA uh, mark, um, are simply not understood by by, by companies. Um, they have come at a time of global pandemic, as we all know, uh, economic crisis. Uh, companies are struggling to keep uh, themselves afloat and alive, and um, to to, have, to make the headspace uh, and, and assign the resource within the company at the time to understand these um, is something not there. Um, I appreciate that these uh, um, you know are best when run on evidence. So I'm going to quote some some figures from uh, Scottish Engineering's last quarterly report, which is a survey of all its members. Very good, 45% response receipt rate and return. So in terms of asking we have you know the question have uh, has your company evaluated the impact of the UK government's UK global tariff proposal to understand the effect on your manufactured product? Um, only forty eight percent of respondents were in a situation where they had evaluated that and understood it. And remember that's not the same as being ready. Um, and fifty two percent responded that they had not evaluated the impact and understood the effect on their uh, their manufactured product. And the UK global global tariff is maybe one that we want to come back to because there are some unintended consequences that, that run out of that uh, as a result. In terms of um, the introduction of the UK conformity assessment, um, are your, is your company adequately prepared for the introduction of the UK CA post -trans transmission with the replacement of the CE mark? Um, exact same numbers. Forty-eight percent of of respondents said that they were, um, and fifty-two percent said they were not. Um, so are they are they ready? No, they're not. And I think there's a bit behind that even where um, um, probably my largest concern, uh, um, given that unfortunately we don't have such a high proportion of of direct export from from our industry in Scotland, um, is that we don't understand the the import impact of exiting the EU. Uh, and the additional burden and costs that that will place on manufacturing engineering sector. 
Um, to go to your third question, and at the end of this, you can maybe give me feedback if these are too brief or too wordy. Um, in terms of the Australia uh, agreement, um, the simple fact is for the sector, as it has been all along, the further we go away from the status quo, the more negative the impact is uh, on on the sector. Um, for a number of reasons, the, the status quo is absolutely the best outcome uh, for manufacturing engineering sector. Uh, and I would say that the Australia uh, type uh, agreement is a pretty long way away from that. Uh, and I suppose that's the way you can cut it: is the further you get away from what we have just now or what we had, um, the more impactful that will be in costs, in resource, um, and extra burden uh, of administration. I'll stop at that, and I can get some feedback on on that. Thanks very much. Our questioning in these virtual sessions is is quite formal, so uh, and we are restricted uh, for time because it's virtual. Uh, so what else shall do is I'll come back to you with my second question, Mr. Sheeran. But I'll first of all go on to uh, Mr. McKenzie. If you could um, address yourself to that, do you need to remind me of the question? Do you need me to remind you of the question, Mr. McKenzie? Do we have Mr. McKenzie? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not hearing Mr. McKenzie, so I think I, I'll go back to Mr. Sheeran if that's all right. Um, I, I wonder if, if you could say you, you did touch Mr. Sheeran on um, uh, the whole issue around imports, and we know that the the supply chain is really important. Uh, to engineering, uh, are you able to say any more about that? About um, what you would like to see in place and what your concerns are with regards to the supply chain um, with a a low deal or a no deal? Uh, so, I mean, the headline uh, in terms of what the sector would like to see, what members have said that they would like to see, is, is close to what we had, uh, and the reasons for that. If you look at UK Global Tariffs uh, as, as a good example, and think about it from an import point of view, um, so uh, it's pretty clear from uh, an ex export point of view, what, you know where, where uh, WTO rules will, will take us. From, a, from an import point of view, there are un unintended consequences in the way that that has been uh, been administered, and so it's been set in a way where. It has tried to simplify things by by putting zero rated tariffs um, on certain uh, items, and typically those items are where they are quite complex, quite integrated, and they are a finished system. So some examples of that are particularly in automotive. Uh, so in automotive, uh, I'll give a, a very specific example. If you are a manufacturer of of refuse trucks in Scotland. And you buy the bare chassis truck uh, from uh, from Europe because that's where they're manufactured. Then, under UK global tariff, you will pay a 10% premium uh, a tariff on that on that chassis. You will then construct a refuse truck around it using your components and manufactured parts, and you will sell it on the market. And it will have a price which reflects the fact that it now has a 10% on the largest single cost component within it. The UK Global Tariff outlines that if you bring in a refuse truck completely finished from uh, the European Union, uh, because it classifies it as a specialist vehicle, a complete specialist vehicle, as a zero tariff rating, and therefore the manufacturer based in Scotland and in this case in the UK um, has a, 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 an unfair ad, a disadvantage against its, its EU counterpart as a result of, I would say, an unintended consequence. Now there is an appeals process to work through that, and that company that I'm citing is working through that just now. Um, but again, cost, administration, management time uh, to understand and get that, and it's not solved yet. Um, and that's one example to give, and that's we see that throughout uh, UK Global Tariff, where there are things which have done been done, no doubt, with good good intent. Uh, for simplification, but they have unintended consequences, and they, they usually sit within the space of finished integrated system or product uh, with complexity um, uh, and a specialist nature overall. And the concern with that is, is this company is well prepared. They have spent a lot of time and effort understanding uh, um, what the impact of their business is going to be. The worry is, is 
that many, many uh, more companies reflected in the, in the statistics that I gave earlier who have not looked at that yet because they have not been able to. And therefore, that is going to be a headache that lands on the plate on the 1st of January. Thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, we have Mr McKenzie back with us, I believe. I'm sorry we lost you, Mr McKenzie. Um, I, I just, in terms of my opening question, um, I basically asked, do you have the information that you need to put everything in place um, by uh, the, the 1st of January, um, given uh, the issues around the, um, the fact that we don't actually have a deal yet? And specifically for your sector, Mr McKenzie, I thank you very much for the briefing. I found it very interesting, and I was particularly interested in what you had to say in the briefing about uh, you, your need to use international road haulage permits and the fact that there seems to be a shortage of them and the implications of that for your industry and indeed all the companies that your industry serve and whether um, you are any further forward in that and perhaps for the point of view of the people listening out there, if you if you could explain um, what it says in your briefing about the um, the issue of road haulage permits. Ah, we don't seem to have any sound from Mr. McKenzie. Like, Can we unmute, um, McKenzie? Sorry, you were yeah. If you start again, Mr. McKenzie, you were muted. All right. Uh, thanks very much indeed, and, and and thanks for your question, Joan. I'll try and answer them. Um, firstly, are we prepared? Absolutely not. This is a shambles. Uh, it has been a shambles from beginning to end, uh, and uh, the information that we have is incomplete, inadequate, and quite often totally incomprehensible. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks about Australia and on Australia-style deal. Uh, you know, this is a nonsense. Australia is a long way away. It is in no way comparable to moving uh, goods from the UK to the EU, our largest trading partner, and back again. Uh, and what it really means is no deal, free trade uh, agreement, and it's kind of dressing things up disingenuously in in uh, in other words. So uh, we we feel we've been badly let down. And we feel we've been badly let down by the UK government from uh, beginning to end. Now, you talk about uh, ECMT permits, um, and uh, I think it's probably just wor worth me uh, explaining a little bit about this uh, very weird uh, and old fashioned thing. Now, ECMT permits were originally designed to get lorries from within the European Union to outside the European Union. So. For example, if you want to get a load to Russia, you need an ECMT permit. So in the UK, there are 8,348 hauliers licensed uh, for international carriage with 83,500 trucks, roughly. In Northern Ireland, the numbers are 1,800 hauliers licensed for international, covering 10,500 trucks, roughly. Taking into account that not all of these trucks will be looking to transit to Europe at the same time, let's take a 50% ratio. That would mean the potential for 47,000 truck movements to Europe. Now, there are only 4,000 permits to allow that access. So that means more than 40,000 trucks wouldn't be able to trade, because uh, each movement needs one permit. This doesn't make sense. This would cripple uh, the economic operations of every haulier that deals in internationally. Um, now, you know, you could say that information on permits and licenses is a moving feast. Uh, and that maybe the government will persuade uh, the EU during the negotiations that ECMT permits will not be needed. Um, it's some people ask me, oh, well, why can't we just print some more, or why can't Europe print some more? Well, it simply doesn't work like that. I'm afraid it's an allocation, uh, and and so it's a really big obstacle to trade uh, between you know Scottish companies and and Europe. And um, you know this is where we are now. The, the current default position is that we are effectively stopping best part of 90% of uh, companies from trading uh, with with Europe. Um, 
It's bonkers. And obviously you'll have raised this issue of the permits with the UK government. I mean, are you feeling that they're taking it seriously? I mean, it sounds really, really grave. Well, I think it is grave. Um, and of course, you know, we, we are engaging with the UK government. Um, and uh, to be fair, our latest communication with the UK government has been more productive than it was, let's say, a month ago. Um, but one of our concerns about the way the UK government is handling this and handing, I mean, they're, they're sending out a lot of PR comms today and, 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 and so forth. And then their messaging seems to be it's up to business to get ready. It's your fault if you're not ready, <laughs> which I think is a bit unfair, because if the mechanisms don't exist that enable hauliers and traders to understand clearly what needs to be done, an end-to-end A to Z process of I have to do this and then this and then this and then this. It, you can't blame traders if they're not ready. The information is not clear. In July, the government issued a border operating model. Uh, you know, we looked at it, frankly has more holes in it than Swiss cheese, and we pointed that out to them. Uh, and then they've done a, a slightly improved version um, still inadequate. So what we've done is we've written to the government, and with your permission, uh, I'd just like to, it, it won't take long, uh, four key points which they must address. And we kept it short because we didn't want this to be kind of enmeshed in, in, in jargon and, uh, you know, obfuscation that they could dodge around. Number one, we want clear, fair and symmetrical market access for UK hauliers after the 1st of January next year. Number two, we want availability of full funding for training outside state aid limitations, um, which are currently £180,000 allowance for uh, trainers, which means that you can train people how to do this stuff, which we haven't had to do uh, for 40 years or so. Thirdly, we want sh a full sharing of the GVMS system, which is the goods vehicle um, movement system, so that industry can prepare for its use. Now, what we've got at the moment is a lot of government secrecy. They have shared GVMS with some haulage companies uh, and called it beta testing. Um, <laughs> but, but why beta test? with a small number of companies when a very much larger number of companies need to see it and understand how it works. So what we're saying is that 100% of haulage companies that will need to use GBMS must be allowed to see it now, not in some week's time when the beta testing has ended. And fourthly, and finally, you'll be glad to hear, we're saying that uh, we want to ensure that the new haulier handbook, which is due uh, 16th of November um, is published as soon as possible and is updated quickly into res in response to changes and response from industry feedback. So if I was to sum all those points up with one sentence, we want clear end-to-end -end journey checklists. Okay, that's uh, that's very clear, and I know that in those areas uh, we have members of the committee that will want to dig down into those areas. So thank you very much for that clarity, uh, and shall now move on to Claire Baker, the vice convener, for her questions. Um, thank you, convener. Um, thank you to the panel this morning for their comments so far. I was interested in uh, the comments that fifty-two percent of the engineering sector. Hadn't, un, hadn't really fully engaged with the UK global tariff, that they felt they were unprepared for the changes that are about to happen. Uh, and in terms of the haulage sector, you've been very clear about the concerns you have for how that will operate in the new year. And I wondered if the panel could talk about, perhaps particularly with engineering, the consequences of 52%. Um, not that the 100% actually feel totally prepared, but 52% who feel completely unprepared, what the consequences are for the Scottish economy and maybe haulage can say in terms of what that is for the Scottish public in terms of the areas like food supply. If Mr Sheeran maybe wants to go first. Okay, I will go first. Um, so, uh, 
you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know that is a is a very large number uh, to be more than fifty percent who have not yet evaluated it only a month ago. Um, is is really a concern. And in terms of the impact, um, the, the 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 truthful answer to that is is there will be substantial impact, but I cannot say how how much it will be. I mean, I think one of the problems with the UK global tariff is having been rushed out uh, with such relatively short time to go before its its actual impact. Um, understanding, it, you know, if any of you have a, a, a spare minute, um, go and have a look. It is extremely complex. There are literally thousands of lines of subcategory components, and companies have to understand every single one of them to understand what the impact of their business will be. Um, so, unfortunately, the, the issue may be is, is they will feel the impact first. They will get tied in knots. They will perhaps fall foul of of of, the, of a, a smooth uh, ability to import the supply chain that they need, and then they will be fighting a rearguard action to understand first to clear the backlog and then mount a, a process to go and appeal against the, you know, the outcome of that to, to, to get a sensible solution that does not have the, the kind of unintended consequences that I talked about before. And what is the so just a follow up, what is the size of the um Scottish engineering sector? Are there in terms of businesses, are they small to medium businesses or are they businesses that have the capacity to address the issues that are happening? Oh, you've got, got me on this. So, in terms of of the sector, there are an estimated ten thousand uh, uh, um, engineering manufacturing companies in Scotland that go down to the very micro uh, SME level. Uh, throughout that, there are, I want to say, there are about one hundred and sixty-five thousand employees in the sector um, uh, across Scotland, uh, from memory. Um, so, sorry, and in terms, does that answer your question? Well, I'm wondering if the smaller businesses have the capacity to deal with. You're talking about a very detailed proposal around the um, the, the global tariff. Whether yeah. businesses well, have the capacity to? No, you, 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 you're absolutely correct. Um, the biggest challenge here are for SMEs who are the hardest pushed, both for resource and and uh, and for cash flow to to manage and deal with these kinds of issues. Um, our largest companies um, will will be well set. They will have had the resource to, to understand. That does not mean that they will not have impact. Um, and then remember, for everyone, including the people who have who have understood and evaluated these, they will still have the, the additional administrative burdens and costs. And so, for most of the smaller companies, SMEs, um, they will not be able to handle these themselves. They will contract. Uh, a customs agency uh, to to manage that on their behalf, and so that will bring an additional cost to the business for zero value. Thank you. I don't know if Mr. McKenzie wants to comment on the impact on the economy and on the the Scottish public if these issues can't be resolved. Uh, well, I think Claire, first of all, uh, the, the uh, my I've, you know the, the crystal ball is. They're pretty muddy on this, not very clear. I can't give you detail of how I think X, Y, and Z will be affected. But I think, uh, as Paul's been saying, you know, there is a general picture here, which is clear, which is that many, many smaller and medium-sized businesses will be impacted negatively by what they're having to do. Uh, and you know, just to pick up uh, on the uh, customs agents' points point, which has just been mentioned by Paul, um, you know, we have estimated that 50,000 customs agents will need to be employed to process uh, all this red tape, which will be created that we've never had to do before. And there are only about maybe between five and 10,000 at most customs agents employed in the UK to do this work. So, you know, quite, addition, quite in addition to the points I was making earlier about lack of clarity, even if you were clear and you were trying to fill in your customs form, we are desperately short of agents who are capable of processing this stuff. So the impact on the economy, it just kind of goes around in a circle, doesn't it? So uh, I can't get my ECMT permit, therefore, uh, you know, I can't travel to Europe. Um, I, I, I want to do my customs forms, but I can't because I can't find an agent or they're too busy and I'm at the back of the queue. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty drastic potential disruption to the Scottish economy uh, through all this. I mean, let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's hope I'm horribly wrong. But at the moment, that's a sort of best worst case scenario. 
Um, thank you. And the final question, Mr. McKenzie has made clear the frustration there has been in speaking to the UK government and to have an understanding of what the challenges facing the sector are. Um, I was wondering if both panellists would like to comment on the support that is from the UK government and the Scottish government in preparing uh, for what is likely to happen, um, and also for the maybe the within Scotland the business support agencies. So you've referred to um, customs uh, agents, and we've referred to the size of Scottish businesses, the capacity issues. Do you feel that the Scottish government and the agencies in Scotland responsible for supporting businesses? Are able to um, provide support at this point and understand, and even to give relevant advice at this point. I'll go first. Uh, so, um, yes, please. Thanks. Um, so, in terms of the support that's coming from 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 Scottish Enterprise and and, and other agencies and, and and local authorities and and so on in, in Scotland, I would say the, the the support has been good. I think there's there's good information uh, there, uh, and there's a willingness to help. Uh, it is not our challenge. Our challenge is not in respect of the information or the support that's available. The challenge is companies being in a situation where they do not have the resource to they still need to put the amount of resource and, and effort and, and, and focus in uh, uh, to get to this and they simply have too many other fires burning um, economically uh, just now for them to get the, the correct amount of headspace to do that in terms of for the UK government I would say what they've put online is good but as we all know just putting something on a website doesn't Mean that it actually gets used and uh, and the uptake is is meaningful in that respect. Um, and I would go back to a comment uh, uh, earlier um, um, made by Rod, which was, I'm perplexed by the UK government's uh, approach on blaming businesses um, that that it's their fault if they're not ready by the first of January. Um, it seems a strange approach when we know we have such a polarising issue um, across the country. Uh, and my concern with that is, is that, that it drives some companies who are absolutely and you know appalled by the concept and the implementation of Brexit, um, and it drives them to do you know what I'm just not I'm not going to make the time and space for that because you know here I am being blamed for something that uh, uh, made no sense in the first place. But it, you know in terms of of, of a, an approach which is actually going to genuinely encourage all companies down to the very smallest. Um, to start looking at that and start being prepared, it seems a strange approach to take the blame game um, and starting position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Our yes. next... Oh, sorry, Mr. McKenzie. Please, on you go. <laughs> no, no, you, you're against the clock. I fully understand that. I agree with what Paul was saying. I think lots of people uh, are doing their very best, including in Scotland. Um, but these are very difficult and challenging times, as Paul has said, and I'll allow you to move on. Thank, Thank you me. very much. I know that there'll be lots more questions for you. Uh, our next um, questioner is Dean Locker, MSP. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and uh, good morning to our panel. Uh, this committee ha has heard evidence that if a Canada-style agreement is reached with the EU, then tariffs will not apply to the vast majority of uh, products being exported to the single market, um, but non-tariff barriers might still be in place. So I'd like to um, get views from our guests uh, about the relative importance of tariffs applying to goods um, versus non-tariff barriers which have to be complied with and, and regulatory divergence, um, potential regulatory divergence in the future. Perhaps I could uh, start with uh, Paul Sheeran on that question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, in terms of the importance of tariffs, um, I think it is fair to say that there, for 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 some companies, the tariffs themselves are less of an issue. But as ever, when you look across the piece, um, there are companies, and in the, in, the, in the example I cited, you know, could potentially undermine and take away their entire competitive position. Uh, as that manufacturing uh, a, a supplier, and that will be replicated. I cannot say hand on heart what I know what the, the percentage split of that would be. I would be honest to say that the bigger concern, uh, and this is where it comes to this Canada, Australia style, the further you move away, and I would say Canada as well, is a long way away from what we have enjoyed, 
further away, away you move, the, 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 the more impactful it will be and the more negatively impactful it will be on the sector. Um, so, yes, tariffs for a certain, but the, the non-trade barriers, barriers, some of the ones that we've talked, the administration burden, and that's before you consider Rod's point of the availability of the things that you need to pay extra to, to get. But one of the things we haven't even talked about yet is, is, the, is divergence from standards um, and divergence from, from, from harmonised standards and directives. Um, you know, brings an even harder to, 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 to evaluate, but even more concerning burden uh, on, on, on manufacturing and engineering sector in particular. If I could explain that one for, uh, for a second, if we've got time, I'll try to do it very quickly. Because we are we're harmonised with the European standards and directives, and generally, if you look at the globe, if you go east from, 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 from Europe and the UK, all the way to, to, to the Far East, that where you know a, a vast bulk of our manufacturing through you know India and Russia, there is generally harmonisation that follows the European Union uh, uh, um, um, standards um, and um, and regulations. Going west towards the US and some of the other Americas, you are into a, a, a landscape of um, accreditation, which is very much commercially driven and it's pay per play. So you have to be a member of something. You have to pay to get accreditation for one particular route. Uh, it's a very much more fragmented, much more um, commercially ne negotiable kind of uh, landscape. And so anything which takes us away from that will bring costs, burdens, uh, you know, a, 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 and detrimental outcome to to the, to the sector. Thanks very much, Paul. That was a very, very interesting uh, perspective. And uh, could I ask Mr. McKenzie the same question, please? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think tariffs are uh, simply not good news. And uh, I, I would e echo uh, uh, Paul's comments. I mean, e you know, obviously I represent road haulage and um, uh, logistics and the, the movement of those goods. Uh, and, and clearly, although arguably we're not at the forefront of tariffs in that sense, because that will affect our customers more, um, you know, anything that affects costs, particularly at a time that we're trying to uh, recover from the economic shock of COVID, uh, is very unwelcome. Uh, and and uh, I, I think the prospect of tariffs is a bleak one. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow up uh, o on the concern about regulatory divergence because one of the uh, bits of legislation the Scottish Parliament is currently considering is the EU Continuity Bill, which you might know will mean that future laws and regulations in Scotland will keep pace with future EU regulations after the transition period when the rest of the UK will not. So there potentially could be regulatory divergence between Scotland and the rest of the UK market. Is that a concern for businesses in your sector? And again, maybe I can start with Paul. So I would I would kind of turn that on its head in that uh, if for a manufacturer in Scotland in engineering in Scotland, if the UK decides to diverge from the EU, the double standards requirement will be there regardless. So anything that they do, where they are are selling to uh, to to Europe and beyond, and all those 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 areas of the world where I said you know do follow harmonisation with the European standards, then the same requirement will will exist. Um, so anywhere that the UK diverges, if you're a, a company in Scotland, regardless of of of, of that um, uh, particular case that you consider within the Scottish Parliament. The burden and the additional cost will come to to those manufacturers because whether if they're exporting outside of the UK, they will have to meet that standard, and if they are uh, supplying within the UK internal market, they'll have to uh, um, um, uh, meet that standard. So I come back to the, the the best solution for the sector for Scotland and the UK is to remain harmonised throughout the UK, uh, and and, you know, and and that would be the same for Scotland. Thanks very much, Paul. And Ms. McKenzie, um, do you have any views on that question? I'm, I'm not sure I can really add anything to this. Um, uh, anything that reduces red tape is good for business, and uh, th th therefore I endorse what Paul has said. That's great. Uh, convener, that's all I had. Thank you very much.
Right, thank you very much. Um, I think our next questioner is Beatrice, Beatrice Bishop. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning, panel. Uh, I just really have one question. I'd like to ask about the um, labour supply and how that will impact on, on your on your different sectors. I mean, we we know that there are a, a lot of drivers uh, from the EU. So I wonder if you give an indication of what the changes will mean um, to your sectors in terms of um, the labour market. Would you like me to go first, as, as you mentioned, drivers? Yes, yes, Mr. Um, McKenzie, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, the, U the UK logistics sector is heavily reliant on migrant labour, uh, particularly from Eastern Europe. And all the signs are that the whole Brexit conundrum has put a lot of them off. And a lot of them have gone to seek employment in, in Germany and elsewhere. So we're already seeing a big drop off in, in, in migrant labour. And it's estimated that at any one point, the logistics sector is short of 50,000 drivers. In Scotland, that figure is around about, we think, 10,000. Uh, and the number increases when we look at warehousing and other subsidiary roles, which again, largely peopled by um, Eastern European staff. Now, the other problem we've got is the industry has an aging workforce. The average age of a lorry driver is 54 years old. And the various COVID restrictions um, around vocational license testing and so forth have made all this worse. In other words, we've got a, 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 a constricted, narrow flow of new blood coming in. Um, so, uh, you know, our big worry is the UK government has not uh, added uh, logistics related roles to the shortage occupation list uh, and agreed salary thresholds, which are clearly designed to appeal to a certain sort of typically university educated or uh, white collar uh, worker, if, if you're looking for a kind of generalization of job roles, has simply not helped. Um, so we think that logistics and road haulage in Scotland uh, will definitely suffer from a skills shortage post Brexit. And I think the only thing that's um, difficult to predict is just by how much. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. And Mr. Sheeran, uh, how, how do you think this was going to impact on the engineering sector? So it's my, my turn to agree with Rod, um, and particularly for our sector, if you if you look at that um, bef before coronavirus and, uh, you know, Aside from Brexit, number one talking point in the industry is skills uh, and shortages. Um, and we have enjoyed um, the the benefit of of the free movement of people to to help out in that respect. And and we've had uh, um, companies up across from the very north to the very south of Scotland who who've enjoyed a, a relatively high proportion of those. And not just in these skilled roles and super skilled roles, but down through semi skilled and and operator roles. And, and they've been welcome and appreciated. We face the same challenges in terms of, of an ageing profile, um, but he, here's something to consider in terms of the impact from, unfortunately, from coronavirus. The coronavirus has brought uh, um, devastation to the, the sector. It has brought, unfortunately, impact to people in, in terms of redundancies. But we also know that we believe that the, the vast majority of those redundancies are happening among people whose choice now will be to retire. So we lose those skills uh, at one end of the distribution scale, but at the other end, the, the fact for 2020 is is that as we stand at the first of November, only 25% of the apprentices of 2019 have been re re have been registered, and that's something like a six seven hundred people fall in new apprentices that will not be available to industry in four years' time. So you add on top of that the the additional administrative burden. Of trying to apply through a process uh, to, to bring somebody in from from a country where previously it, there was free movement and they were able to come in, then you have a, another headache to add to a skills issue which has long been uh, there in our sector. And then just on the line, although that you know that that process will, will be in place and there's been moves to make to simplify it, it is still an extra step that for SMEs and the very smallest companies will be a step too far in terms of the, having the resource. Be able to manage, apply, be diligent, have the patience to go through that process um, to, to, to bring somebody in. And so, again, for that reason, the, the, the constant theme throughout, 
what we had is absolutely best fit for the sector and industry in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth Gibson is up next. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, panel, um, and uh, good morning, convener. Um, the, in terms of the Road Haulage Association, I'm just wondering uh, what's going to be the impact on viability and competitiveness of the sector um, if uh, the issues which Mr. McKenzie highlighted are not resolved by the end of this year. It's, it's it's very worrying. Uh, I, I completely um, I, I share an anxiety uh, with with many uh, road haulage firms in Scotland. Um, it's worth remembering that most uh, haulage firms in Scotland are SME. Um, they do not necessarily have a big back back office that can process vast amounts of red tape. So as I was saying earlier, they will need probably to engage with. Uh, uh, broker, brokers, if um, if they if they do any sort of international trade, um, that's a big worry for them. I think staff shortages have always been a concern. Certainly for some firms, it is it is always Apache. You know, some of the big the big firms won't struggle to attract drivers, perhaps because but they have a more attractive uh, pay rate or, or terms and conditions or whatever. But given that our industry is not like that. Our industry is typically family-owned, SME, small number of trucks, five in, in a company perhaps, or even fewer, some owner-drivers and so forth. That is a huge worry. And when I talk to owner-drivers uh, and small operators, uh, this burden, uh, the burden of red tape, uh, extra worry on top of what they're doing to try and make a living. And it's worth remembering that the margins that most road hauliers make is about 2%. Yeah. And, and if you erode that through any one of any number of negative increasing costs on their business, you're driving them out of business. And there are certainly one or two that I've spoken to, both in England and Scotland, who have said, you know what, I, I just don't think it's worth it anymore. I'm thinking about closing down. Now, you know, that's anecdotal. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not fully researched and they may change their minds. But the very fact people are thinking about that, what generally has always been a very positive industry, is concerning and does concern me. Yeah, I mean, I can understand. I mean, I was when I saw the two, two or three percent um, margin in your submission. Actually, I, I thought to myself, if people are going to have the extra cost, including uh, the cost of time, and indeed perhaps greater um, time having to queue at ports, etc., then that's going to put costs up. And of course, that itself is going to impact on competitive, competitive, competitiveness of wider industry across uh, the UK, pushing up costs now. You, you, you talked about the, the four issues which you really need to see resolved um, in order to get the best out of a, a very bad deal. We're only a few weeks away now from Christmas and the 1st of January. Uh, how long do you think, assuming the UK government was to say, absolutely, we agree with everything that you're saying, we're going to do everything we can to resolve this as soon as possible, with a fair wind, how long do you think it would be able to take for these matters to be resolved? Or do you think that we are now at a situation whereby, even with the best will in the world, the mechanics of the way the UK and the EU are working with the background of COVID, this could take several months to resolve into the new year and potentially cause um, hold-ups at the ports uh, from January? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that we, we cannot make this good from where we are now. What we can do with a with a fair wind, and if we all pull together, uh, is to mitigate some of the worst effects. But it's mitigation. You're absolutely right. There's very few days to go, um, and I, I don't keep a running list because it depresses me too much. So uh, the clock is ticking, and we're we're nearing this um, exit point. And I think that um, it is just going to be really difficult. That you raised some really good points in your question. You know, one of them about these lorry parks, which aren't really lorry parks, which are springing up all over uh, England, England, uh, and which are designed to 
frankly stop big queues at Dover and other ports, which uh, no doubt would not look good on the television news. And uh, instead, there are sort of diversion, a holding area where trucks that haven't got the right paperwork can be corralled and held uh, until the paperwork's been sorted out. Um, but the paperwork is complex. There are not enough customs agents and we still don't have, you know, that simple end to end journey clarity that we need. And when you don't, when the government's not able to spell that out, what that means is that um, the people, the customs agents who have to do the paperwork don't themselves know. And some of them are making it up as they, they go along inevitably. And that means that some mistakes will be made. And that means that some trucks will get stopped. And that means there will be some display d delay to the supply chain. The scale of it, we don't know until it happens. Um, so, you know, your question, which is, um, can we make it perfect? No, we can't. Can we uh, make it work? We always do, because that's what logistics does. Will there be mistakes and delays? Yes, there will. How bad will those things be? We don't know. Uh, and, I, and I guess that's probably, in summary, uh, where we are at the moment. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. Just before I move to Mr. Sheeran, just one further short question. Is there any upside? for you to Brexit, to the Road Haulage Association? Well, I mean, it's, all, it's a kind of political question. I think um, what, I, what I should say is that uh, our members, some of them voted for Brexit and some of them didn't. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's a, a, a very fair point to make. Our focus has simply been on, uh, you know, a decision has been made, uh, a vote has been held. We are now dealing with the consequences of that. We must do that the best way we can. I am, of course, critical of what the government has done by way of preparation. I think that's not so much a political point as an operational point. Um, but certainly we're, we're not in an ideal place where we are right here, right now. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Ms. McKenzie. And Mr. Sheeran, uh, that point, is there any upside to manufacturing of the current Brexit uh, position that we're in at the moment? So there are a few very small, isolated examples where companies are almost surprised to, to, to see something. They go, oh, there's a, a small benefit to Brexit. Um, but they're far outweighed. Uh, there is no doubt that the, the balance is, 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 is strongly against there being any benefit to Brexit overall. Uh, the, the costs, burdens, the administrative uh, resource um, additions uh, just make this something that is, does not make sense for the engineering manufacturing sector. I mean, you've said actually that, and I quote, an estimated 400 million extra customs declarations could average up to 13 billion a year. Um, you know, additional cost to UK businesses, and you, you actually um, th there's an example of a technical ceramics manufacturer, Kurstec in Fife, um, where its parent company is citing the potential impact of Brexit is one of its reasons for exiting Scotland. Is that something you expect to see more of in the months ahead, or are you hoping that that can be mitigated by government? Well, I, I hope it, it, it can be mitigated. I, I think actually the mitigation doesn't come from 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 companies. Uh, sorry, it doesn't come from government so much as it comes from companies. There are a number of inwardly invested companies in Scotland just now who are literally, you know, fighting to make sure that if any harsh, tough decisions are taken at corporate level, they are not the the recipients of that. In that respect, I would say we very much welcomed uh, the statement by the first minister last week that, that you know, at all levels of of of, of tiered lockdown in Scotland. Um, you know the, the the intent to keep manufacturing engineering uh, uh, going. That's one that really really helps in that respect. And and that being said publicly, uh, is very very helpful to those inwardly invested companies. Thank you. And just lastly, if I may convene uh, to Mr. Sheeran, I mean you, you've talked about the the uh, impact on families of of the huge change that we're about to see, and you talk about the products we love the technology behind our schools and hospitals, even the meals we consume. And you've said that um, Britain is our leading exporter of innovation, product and technical skills. Uh, I'm just wondering how you feel uh, innovation, product and technical skills will be impacted um, if we have a, a no-deal Brexit. So, um, again, I think it's one of those ones where I can't hand on heart say, here's the number of what the impact will be. But I think it's, uh, it's one of these ones where it's 
it's, it's the unintended consequences. If you look at the level of uncertainty that we face from the 1st of January, if we end up exiting with no deal Brexit, then we'll have companies finding out day by day challenges in, in, in the administration, in the finding customs agencies, in understanding the actual impacts of global tariff, and that is where their resource will go. And what will lose out is their focus on R and D and innovation. And as and, and any cash impact from that, so any cost impact from that, will mean that they will have to tighten their belt elsewhere. And unfortunately, that could be in the area of innovation. And those would be extremely detrimental to, to, to the sector for Scotland. Thank you much, very much, Mr Shield. Thank you, and thank you to Ms McKenzie. Come here. Thank you very much. Um, Ross Greed is our next questioner. Thank you, convener. I'm interested in the impact of the new arrangements for the Irish sea border, the border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain within the UK through the Irish Protocol. What impact that's going to have on your sectors? But I suppose the first question to ask, um, because no, none of us are, are quite sure, is what is your understanding of what the arrangements will be between Great Britain and Northern Ireland from the 1st of January? Well, if I'm uh, picking that up, uh, the, the short answer is not very clear. Um, you know, I suppose what uh, uh, to, to flesh that out a bit. I think the government's left itself very little time to mobilise its new TSS, which stands for Trader Support Service. Um, now, it's announced that it's investing £200 million in that, and the aim of it is to reduce the burden on traders moving goods to Northern Ireland and help them prepare for all this. Um, I think it's going to be very challenging to establish the TSS by uh, 1st of Jan uh, in, in full working order. Um, and many Northern Ireland traders haven't signed up to it. Um, and one of the reasons they don't sign up to it is they are worried that there is too much sharing of um, sensitive business information. In other words, uh, TSS is, 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 as it were, you know, heavily. Some of the big, the bigger companies in Northern Ireland um, are very involved in TSS, and they can see uh, information about smaller companies, which theoretically might give them a business advantage. Now, um, we don't know that that's definitely happening, but people get worried about stuff like that, about giving away, uh, you know, trade secrets, as it were. Um, so there is a lack, if you like, of faith in that side of things. Um, but, you know, just generally on TSS, um, we haven't got enough staff recruited to do that. Uh, the software, uh, well, look, um, you, you know, big software projects we know need 18 months, two years to complete. And we're doing this uh, in, in fast forward time in a matter of weeks or months um, or days, indeed. Um, and uh, there's also a need to educate users into how TSS will work. Um, un ongoing uncertainty, you know, and that's even without mentioning the obvious, which is that there's a huge level of uncertainty about the requirements for the movements of goods under, uh, you know, the Irish protocol. And a very high chance uh, that you know goods simply won't be ready uh, ready to move. Um, so uh, you know we don't, for example, even know um, whether um, ECMT permits will be needed to travel to the Republic of Ireland. Uh, potentially, yes, if you're travelling from Great Britain. Um, but ministers have announced that you won't need ECMT permits crossing from Northern Ireland to the Republic if you have a Northern Irish O license. Uh, but, you know, again, it, it, take one example. There's a lot of unknowns here. That's it. Thanks very much, Mr. McKenzie. Um, before moving on to a range of other questions, the, the, more, the more that you say, uh, the less realistic it feels that there's going to be uh, a, a coherent set of arrangements in place on the first of January, whether whether or not in the longer term something is in place that can that can manage this, that there's enough faith from business in, in the systems the UK government's setting up is is a secondary concern at the moment. Um, what what is the disruption to the supply chain though? What's the what is the impact, particularly on 
uh, on the sectors that are, are dealing through uh, through road haulage, if on the first of January these arrangements uh, for trade and travel between Great Britain and Northern Ireland simply aren't in place, what does that mean for your drivers? Well, it, it means delays. I think um, I, I can't predict how good or how bad it would be. As, I, as I've said earlier, you, you know, it's, it's crystal ball time. But I think it would be reasonable to assume that not everything will be perfect on the 1st of January. Now, what not perfect looks like in detail is, is very hard to second guess. But what it could mean, for example, as I mentioned earlier, is if your paperwork is not quite right, if you're not border ready, um, you will be diverted, your lorry, you and your lorry and, and the driver will be diverted to a holding area, perhaps in Warrington, perhaps near Birmingham, perhaps in Kent, um, uh, where you'll have to stay until um, you, you know the paperwork is all uh, correct, and then you can move. Um, now, the scale of that and the scale of the mistakes that are made on all this, it's, it's hard to tell. And also the one, I guess there is an unknown, which is uh, the negotiations which are still going on with the EU and whether there is some sort of uh, uh, let off clause or easement uh, of, of regulations, which, which might be helpful. Um, very hard to say. Um, not confident of success, uh, always hopeful that things will be better than uh, my pessimistic self is saying, um, but, but very hard to tell and very hard to answer your question with certainty. Thank you. Just before I um, turn it to Mr Sheeran, there is a little bit of, of coverage in the Irish press today about businesses based in Great Britain pulling out of Northern Ireland or making arrangements to, to reduce the amount of business they, they do there. I think a lot of that has come off the back of some comments from ministers in the Northern Irish Executive. Have you seen any evidence so far, any changes in, um, in uh, the, the kind of businesses that, that would use road haulage? Um, any evidence that those changes are beginning to, to take place, where perhaps that traffic between Northern Ireland and, and Great Britain is is reducing or changing. People are finding alternatives. Well, I think businesses are endlessly creative and good at problem solving. That's why they're in the logistics trade, because logistics is all about that sort of uh, problem solving. I'm I'm not an authority on the reports that you quote. Uh, or uh, neither do I have any evidence of it. It's not particularly surprising, uh, but but I don't think I can shed any light on it. I'm afraid. Thanks very much. Um, and just uh, turning back to, to Mr. Sheeran for my original question, I'm interested in what the impact is on on the supply chain and engineering and manufacturing of disruption at the this in the sea border, the Northern Ireland Great Britain border. What does that look like for for your industry? So again, an honest answer is that the honest answer is we just don't know. Um, and to be honest, of all the things even that we are pressing uh, member companies to, to, to get to just now, it, it, be, because of the size and scale of the amount of flow of goods, uh, we are very much pressing uh, those who have done nothing to, to understand some of the, the, the basic principles of UK Global Tariff and UK CEA Mark first. Um, so the, the, the unfortunate answer to that is, is we just don't know, which means that we are sailing in, in, into a, a possible outcome line. And what I would say in, in terms of concerns, and, and it maybe talks a little bit uh, what Rod said, is because it is just a concern that is voiced, is when you look at that, that arrangement, you, know, you could see it either being relatively light touch, which would mean that we have Less of an administrative burden, or it could be very heavy, uh, you know, uh, heavily enforced, and therefore a strong administrative burden. And each has the consequences. If it's a light touch, the concern is, is it becomes a backdoor for 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 um, for avoidance of tariff, uh, which makes a, a competitive disadvantage. No reason to believe why that might be, uh, but you know that is a concern that's been voiced to me several times by member companies in the last few months. Thanks. And just again, following up the uh, previous question that I asked, if we could well come to a, a point where it's light touch, there's faith from business, the administration of it works quite well. It feels increasingly unrealistic that that is going to be in place on the first of January. So, if it's not, what does that short-term disruption look like to the supply chains in your industry, and what's the the practical effect of that that people would would notice? 
So, um, on a smaller scale, uh, um, anything that, that, that brings delay and administrative burden will, will bring costs, additional costs uh, for no value to, to, to the supply chain um, uh, partners. You know, I think the thing to, to think about that is, is if you talk to actual engineering manufacturing companies who are moving goods around Europe and, and say, where are we on things like, so where it becomes difficult, those which are at the edge and have very well uh, structured kind of uh, process. So I'm thinking Norway and Switzerland are the areas that we say, well, you hit, you know, you can by law of averages, you will hit issues there um, much, much more frequently than you will have anywhere else. And those are well established, well set up, long standing situations. You know, when you take your example for an absolute, you know. Um, very difficult to get your head around set of, of circumstances for for uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland uh, um, uh, movement of goods, uh, and I wouldn't pretend to say I understand it. Then you compare and contrast that to something where people already say, "Yeah, we already have issues where where there's something just a bit different," and then you throw at it the unpreparedness for for that situation. And and I'm I'm sorry to say, but I do think that it will be significantly impactful. Thank you. That's all for me, convener. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Sheeran, I understand that you had another appointment that meant you had to leave at 10 o'clock. Is that the case? That is the case. Okay. Well, um, it's 10 o'clock now. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving evidence to us today. Um, we will continue the rest of our session with Mr McKenzie. Um, we we'll now move on to Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Convener. I'm sorry. I, I would have, I'd like to, to have a re question with Mr. Sheeran, but that's, that's live. Um, Ms. McKenzie, um, I, I don't know if you're aware, but this morning uh, we hear that, um, uh, in fact, uh, the three leading Scottish uh, food and drink trade bodies have written uh, a letter to the UK Prime Minister seeking uh, a six-month grace period to be negotiated to allow business to adapt. Brexit, citing in particular, of course, the impacts of the global pandemic, the fact that we're now in the second wave, the huge uncertainties that still remain, the huge costs that have already been incurred by business out of the pandemic. Would you support that call? Anything that buys us more time, given we started very late. Um, is uh, useful. Um, I, I mean, I think it, it is all, as I understand it. I'm no no particular. I've no particular insight on the detail of the EU talks, but I understand that is uh, one of the things that has been raised in this sort of final round of talks. You know, a, a sort of light touch uh, regulation or a blind eye to uh, uh, problems, uh, and and anything that says or does that buys us more time is clearly is useful because i can't think of any of my members uh who would who would say no nah, actually we don't want that we're ready um you know it, it's just useful um so uh, we'd be happy to go along with that okay uh, uh, well that's very unequivocal uh, and i would imagine that uh, there'd be many other sectors um seeking to indicate their support today to this uh, initiative on the part of the food and drink industry in Scotland, which of course is massively important to the Scottish mm -hmm. economy, 15 billion, uh, and I think over 120,000 people involved, four times more important to the Scottish economy than to uh, England. So we will uh, look uh, for developments on that uh, very carefully. If I could um, turn to uh, the lorry park thing. I mean, I, we hear the lorry mm. park phrase, and it would be quite interesting, I think, uh, uh, in terms of elucidation, if you could maybe paint a picture of, of what that means. And I know that you said in an earlier answer that um, you know, there will be several of these to try to avoid the, the, you know, the, the bad PR of you know endless queues at Dover and so forth. But equally, presumably, you know, there will be queues in and out of these parks. You know, you have to get into them, and you have to get out of them. And you know, depending upon how long you have to stay, what then will be the facilities at these parks in terms of food, in terms of toilet arrangements, in terms of security? Who's paying to stay in the lorry parks? What are the rates going to be? 
if there's a charge on the 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 the, the haulage contractor. Uh, and um, you know all these questions, and in the midst of a global pandemic, what would be the COVID implications of running a lorry park in the midst of a global pandemic, with rules may, you know, of necessity required to be different to what lorry park rules would be absent a global pandemic? So, if you could paint a picture of what your understanding of this is, I think that would perhaps be helpful. Thank you. Well, I've been a, a critic of these so-called lorry parks, and, I, and I'll explain why I think they're so-called. Uh, to me, lorry parks sound like nice places where you would go and park your truck because it's time for your statutory rest break, where you can maybe you can you can clean up, you can maybe have a shower, you can have a nice meal, um, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, now, what we've got instead are um, not lorry parks, but places where lorries will be held, and that is a much more kind of basic arrangement. Um, and even recently, I was seeing uh, you know earth movers creating these things. So with with a matter of a small number of weeks to go, it's hard to believe, even with the best of Scottish and British ingenuity, that these places can turn into kind of luxury venues. Uh, so I worry about lorry drivers, that we, we don't treat them well in the UK anyway. Um, the, the conditions that we ask them to go through, even in, in proper lorry parks, are pretty poor, mostly. And uh, the idea that these um, kind of cage areas uh, will be uh, decent places absolutely is is very worrying to me. I'm very concerned about the COVID implications. You know, if they are not properly, um, you know, there's not possible to socially distance. That is a problem. We saw in the first wave of lockdown back in March, laboratories being closed and uh, wash facilities being closed, which is nuts when we're asking people to wash their hands uh, and and all that sort of thing. So uh, I've got huge, huge worries about um, so-called lorry parks. Um, and you know, what if it takes 48, 72 hours to get your paperwork sorted, which you're a lorry driver, you're entirely innocent uh, because of some probably inadvertent mistake that someone has made in, in, in this mountain of red tape that needs to be done. Um, I, I, I feel so sorry for them having to go through what would be a pretty unpleasant stay. I, you know, if, if the government can prove to me these are nice places, fair enough, but I don't suppose they're going to be. And, and it's a big worry, and it's a big worry if they're held there for a long time. And of course, there's the local people aspect as well, which you quite rightly raise, which is um, in, in avoiding queues at Dover, where the 10,000 lorries a day use Dover port, uh, you might just be moving thousands of lorries to somewhere near Birmingham or Manchester or whatever. Um, and, and that's... Uh, and that still means there are lorries being delayed, diverted, with an impact on supply chains and people's livelihoods and people's, you know, frankly, basic comforts. Okay, it's all extremely worrying. And uh, as you say, uh, it doesn't appear that the UK government is uh, at all considering the welfare of the driver, uh, which is crucially important. Um, I mean, maybe we could ask if Dominic Cummings could go on one of his driving trips and have a wee tour around and see see if he could report back on how it's all going. Can I ask a, and one last question, if I may, Mr McKenzie? Um, so the, I understand that the UK is commissioning ferries to, to deal with exports. Do you know much about this? How many? And do you have any detail about how that will work? Which uh, kind of contractors well, will uh, have access to the ferry to use? Well, the government is certainly putting in place a whole range of mitigations, including um, the acquisition of ferries, I'm sure, but um, which they did uh, in you know about a year ago when we were going through all this again. You know, the, comp the ferry company which didn't have any ferries. Everyone will, will remember that. Um, I'm I'm not uh, uh, au fait with the detail of that, and so I can't give you a. Uh, precise update on what's happening there, but clearly there is a concern that um, 
we depend on transport, we depend on international trade, we depend on European trade, and it is very important that the all-important just-in-time supply chain on which the British economy is largely built can function after the 1st of January 2021. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Mackenzie. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Annabelle. We'll now move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson, who will be followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. And, and just to depress uh, Mr Mackenzie uh, more than he might be, my calculation says there's 1,237 hours. Uh, until the 1st of January, and, and the reality is that is a blink of an eye in planning uh, for business terms. I wanted to just ask uh, a, a couple of questions. First one, a fairly straightforward one. Um, we have talked uh, a good deal about the transport permit, uh, but in terms of uh, many of these uh, small transport companies, and there are quite a lot of them in my constituency, in the North East of Scotland in particular, uh, more generally, um, part of the profit, perhaps all of the profit on journeys, will come from the backhaul. In other words, we have a major load going in one direction, but we only really make money if we're able to get some goods to bring back with us. Are there particular problems uh, for uh, GB-based uh, hauliers, Scottish-based hauliers in particular, um, in getting access to uh, goods from Europe? That to fill the empty lorry that's going back uh, in in that direction, or vice versa. Well, um, it's a very good question, um, and um, uh, you, you know we understand that cabotage, which this is the sort of uh, uh, slightly odd old-fashioned phrase that this back backloads refers to, or can refer to, and refers to other things as well. Um, may not be allowed, uh, so can, cannot happen. Uh, and again, that would impact um, uh, profits. Um, and, and environmentally, it's not ideal, is it? Because uh, it means if you're running an empty trailer, um, you know, that's not the best thing in the world in terms of business efficiency and fuel and everything else. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern about this. And uh, it would impact profits. Uh, and as I was saying earlier, you know, profit margins on a business of 2%, 3%, maybe if you're lucky, for many hauliers, um, including your constituents uh, in the northeast of Scotland, uh, it, that's a very worrying situation. I wish I could bring you some uh, good news, reassurance, or anything else, but uh, all I can really say meaningfully is that I share your concern. Uh Thank you very much, Mr. McKenzie. That's pretty much what I expected, but it was important to get it on the record from the Road Haulage Association rather than simply from from me. Now, uh, you earlier said mistakes will be made, and I think you know we all are in the position where we expect that to be the case. Um, and I want to just focus on what some of the consequences of these mistakes might be, in particular for the drivers. Now, you made reference to drivers being marooned. I, that's my word, not yours, uh, in lorry parks while they wait for paperwork to be sorted out. But I'm also thinking about the mis mistakes. Uh, and I, I give you an example. It's a 10-year-old example of how even in the uh, single market, there were barrier issues from country to country within the single market. Uh, one of my constituents, uh, uh, I, it took me a week to get him out of a French prison cell uh, because he had forgotten that when you crossed a threshold of the amount of cash you were carrying, you had to declare it, even though you were in a single a single market. And, and, the, and the French are in particular, uh, that tends to be the approach that they take to quite small uh, issues. And I just wonder, in relation to the set of rules that there are for crossing from one country to another within the European Union, given that we are no longer a European Union state, is that going to present a whole set of new issues and opportunities, in particular for the French, to simply uh, put people in a cell and, and wait and see what happens? Because that tends to be the, 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 the approach they, they, they tend to take. Mr McKenzie. It, 
Yes, it's 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 very worrying, isn't it? Um, and I I and I can identify and I understand the example that you gave from some years ago, uh, and they clearly exist in, in every police force. Uh, some people who are particularly um, keen on enforcement uh, to the nth degree, uh, and that's worrying. Um, you know, there are things like, for example, we'll have to uh, display a GB sticker on the rear of vehicles and trailers, even if, it, if the vehicle has a number plate with a Euro symbol or a GB national identifier. But weirdly, we don't need to display a GB sticker to drive to Ireland. Um, so there are there is a potential for rules in, inadvertently to be broken. Um, uh, we talked about, you know, people being held at lorry parks in unpleasant conditions. So I don't, uh, you know, I won't go th through that again. I mean, w one of the things um, that is to do with uh, permits is, you know, it's absolutely vital that uh, hauliers get ECMT or other, you know, permits for international journeys, um, and they need to register uh, vehicle trailers. Uh, and vehicle registration documents will be much more complex and, and all that. Um, there are details online of how to do this and obviously uh, plenty of help available, not least from the RHA on our website. Um, but, you know, one of the things, for example, that occurs to me is, is the, you know, the whole check and HGV is ready to cross the border service. It's a snappy title for something uh, that proves that the HGV has the right EU import and commodity documents for the goods it's carrying before it crosses the GB uh, EU border. And you, you've got to use that service for HGVs traveling via the Port of Dover or Eurotunnel to get what's called a Kent access permit before they enter Kent. Now, <laughs> that if you fail to do that, you could be fined £300 um, yes. and um, it'll be optional. For um, it'll be optional to use the service for all other GB ports. So there are lots of things you can get wrong. And uh, it's a worry. Uh, again, to answer your question directly, obviously we don't know exactly to what extent French or other uh, authorities will uh, be rigorous in enforcing the strict letter of the law, because frankly we don't know what the letter of the law is, because we won't know that until the talks are uh, over one way or another. But um, you know, in summary, it's a concern. Uh, thank you for that. And this is probably my final question. Um, it, now that uh, the UK GB in particular is outside the EU, uh, will hauliers filling their fuel tanks in the, the UK be able to do so without paying customs duty? Because they will, of course, be exporting that fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I ask this as someone who happens to be a private pilot, uh, who before the single market, we used to be able to essentially reclaim our customs duty on fuel if we were travelling uh, internationally. And it strikes me that, that that's there. And equally in relation to fuel, um, there have been instances in the past where other jurisdictions have decided that the tanks for fuel attached to vehicles are so large that it constitutes an import with the potential of being used for other purposes and simply propelling uh, the vehicle. Are the whole issues and complexities, the VAT on fuel, I suspect is more straightforward, maybe not, but the customs duty on fuel, um, I, I, I can see issues. And this is quite a big cost for the industry and for the many SMEs, and of course further sources of paperwork difficulty. Are there issues around all that, or am I simply um, uh, making a problem where there is no problem? Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. Well, I, I, to be honest with you, I have to be honest with you, uh, with you and say I'm, I'm not aware of this as a problem at the moment, which doesn't mean to say it isn't uh, on the horizon, and I will go and check and, and make some inquiries about it. Um, it's not something I had heard about up to this point. Well, I'll, I'll just close by saying it is an issue that has been raised to me, not because people have decided it's a problem, but because people think it might be a problem. So I, I would Absolutely. certainly be grateful if, 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 yeah. if your view, which may not be the yeah. final view, because that's really up to the UK government. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah. McKenzie, and thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart Stevenson. And now our last questioner is Oliver Mundell, MSP. 
Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, Ms. McKenzie, I'm pleased to hear you talk about driver standards uh, and, and the conditions drivers are expected to work in, because I've been absolutely appalled uh, during the pandemic um, and have raised the issue several times uh, with the Storage Transport Minister uh, about the closure of, of, of driver facilities, uh, because I think it makes no sense. And I think at a time uh, when we've been asking uh, drivers uh, to work longer hours and really to, to bust a gut to keep food on our shelves. It just seemed uh, so wrong, uh, particularly uh, truck stops in, in my constituency along the M74, um, who had been cleared uh, by local health and safety to open to provide drivers with a hot meal uh, out of their cab, being told uh, that they couldn't open. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear as an association uh, you know, that, that these, these things are on uh, your radar with, with COVID uh, resurging uh, and uh, the challenges that we all know about in relation to Brexit. But I wanted to ask you specifically about the comments earlier on driver uh, shortages. Um, if, if that is going to be a problem uh, now that we have left the EU, uh, what plans uh, do you have in place to, to help boost driver numbers in Scotland and attract people uh, into these jobs, particularly uh, with the economic challenges we are facing? Well, uh, one of the problems uh, we've, we've had to face, I think, is uh, the apprenticeship levy in the UK, um, which was designed to generate money to allow apprenticeships to happen and new people to be recruited into industry. Uh, but the road haulage sector has only been able to draw down a tiny fraction of the amounts that we would have liked to have drawn down to train the next generation of drivers, warehouse workers, and other logistics workers. Um, so the RHA has launched uh, Road to Logistics, which is a company which aims to uh, train the next generation of drivers uh, and warehouse and other staff. Uh, and, and essentially, the idea there is, um, you know, there are a, a number of people, for example, those leaving the armed forces, uh, or uh, perhaps um, uh, prisoners, uh, or, or those on rehabilitation from prison who are looking to take up a, uh, you know, a career uh, when they leave prison, and uh, a, a whole variety of other people from different backgrounds and all the rest of it. Um, and we think that's very important, and that's something we want to do, and that's never been more important than now, where we see that um, European, Eastern European drivers and other logistics workers who've been so important to us over the last 10, 15 years are choosing to go home or to go to Germany, perhaps more accurately, to work for German firms. Um, and, uh, you, you know, they have felt, um, you know, they're either not welcome in the UK because we've, uh, we've, because of Brexit or uh, simply the exchange rate and the, economy, the, the economics of, of sending money back home hasn't, hasn't worked for them. Um, so we've got a big problem. Uh, we've got a big problem with the image of our industry. Um, and uh, you, you spoke about the way lorry drivers have been treated uh, over COVID, which I think has been uh, often disgraceful, not universally so, but often disgraceful. Um, without trucks, you get nothing. You know, 95% plus of things we get in Britain come on the back of a lorry and at some point. And yet, I regret to say that some people treat lorry drivers as the lowest of the low. Uh, you know, and we had many instances of them being refused toilets during COVID lockdown one um, on the grounds that it was sort of... Um, unsafe for health and safety reasons. Uh, you can't use the wash basin for the same reason. Uh, absolutely disgraceful. And we called out uh, people who did that, uh, and we complained, uh, and we got the uh, both the Scottish uh, Cab Secretary for Transport and the English UK Government uh, uh, Roads Minister to write letters that could be printed out and held in cabs by drivers to say, look, there's the proof. You have to give me a toilet. You have to let me wash my hands. Um, but uh, the, the difficulty is when you're looking outside, you're a young person, and you're looking at it, what job am I going to do? And you see that sort of treatment, that sort of lack of respect for these vital essential workers. And they are essential workers classified as such by the government 
even in English COVID lockdown too, and, and obviously in the five tiers in, in Scotland, um, being treated like that, you think, wow, now there is a case of essential workers being treated like second class citizens, and it makes me very angry. Um, so we must do what we can to make the industry more attractive. Uh, we, we need to recruit fresh blood. We need to re recruit fresh Scottish blood because we can't apply, uh, uh, rely on Romanian and, and Polish blood anymore. So uh, we, we need to try and do that. We need to encourage wherever we can in little ways and big ways uh, a, a new breed, uh, a new generation of people into our industry. Well, that, that that's really helpful, and I absolutely would associate myself with those comments. I think you know, with, without um, HGV drivers uh, you know, tra traveling around the country, we, we would all be stuck. And you know, I think it's a very tough gig. Uh, you know, being away from home often uh, for, for days on end, and it, it's, it's something I you know, always always reflect on. But uh, as a second uh, question, I just wondered kind of what how how things would work the other way with with, with EU. Uh, trucks coming into the UK, because uh, that, that, that's something uh, you know, I've, I've heard you know, in the past from, from local haulage companies. Is, you know, there's an awful lot of EU trucks uh, you know, coming into the, the UK, and drivers are often you know, not always pleased about that, and sometimes feel uh, you know, that there's, there's a sort of imbalance you know, with, with, with a lot of EU trucks coming into the UK, and it's just how will they get back out if, if we have this sort of lorry park in Kent? Yeah, well, um... Uh, d details unknown. Um, obviously, we know that uh, ECMT permits kind of will, will need to work uh, both ways. Um, so, uh, but the precise, I think what is not clear from the talks that are going on at the moment is the extent to which there will be easements or similar that will make it easier for trade to happen and supply chains to move. Um, so again, I can't sort of completely answer your question. Uh, it's a very, very valid question that you ask and a very, you know, a, a big and reasonable concern, but it's a kind of watch this space answer, I fear. Well, thank you. That, that, I think that's the best we can do for now, Camino. But thank you very much for that, Mr McKenzie. Uh, th thank you very much. And uh, that complete our first panel. Uh, can I apologise to those members who did not have the opportunity to ask Mr Sheeran a question? Um, unfortunately, he did have to leave at 10, and he told us that well in advance. And Can I thank Mr McKenzie for holding the fort uh, on his own after Mr Sheeran left? Uh, we shall now have a, a, a brief suspension uh, before our second panel come on board. Uh, thanks again to our witness.
Welcome back, everyone. I can now welcome to the meeting our second panel of witnesses. They are Dr. Richard Torbett, Chief Executive of the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry, the ABPI, and Richard Carter, the Managing Director of BASF Limited. Um, I will start with questions and then move on to the Deputy Convener and the other MSPs. Welcome to both our witnesses. Thank you for coming today. Um, can I start by uh, basically asking the same question as I asked our first panel of witnesses? Um, we're, we're just you know, weeks away uh, from what could be a, a hard Brexit. We still don't have any deal. Do you have the information that you need? Do you have the time to prepare? And would you be able to reflect on the Prime Minister's uh, comments last month that we were heading for an Australian type deal? How would an Australian type deal affect your particular industry? Um, can we start with Dr. Torbert? Hey, good morning, and it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, so, I represent the research based pharmaceutical industry in the UK. We supply uh, medicines and, of course, research and development new medicines and vaccines of the future, including for COVID, uh, which may become relevant later on in the conversation. Um, we are, rightly so, a very heavily regulated industry. And so, there have been very significant implications for us uh, from the decision to leave the European Union. From the day after the referendum in 2016, our industry has gone to enormous efforts to really try and understand everything that needs to be done in order to be as ready as possible. Um, in answer to your question, do we have the right amount of information? I would say it's a mixed picture. Where we have the information, uh, I think we have good confidence that our businesses have done everything they possibly can do within their power to be as ready as possible. Um, but there are some areas, which I'll go into in a minute, where we still don't have guidance. Um, they particularly relate to Northern Ireland, uh, which is a, a subject I'll, I'll come on to in a second. Um, the first priority for us is to make sure we can continue to supply medicines to patients everywhere in the UK. And as we have heard uh, in the last session, particularly around supply routes into the UK, we are expecting and have been expecting for some time disruption, particularly around the short straits between Dover and Calais. Uh, medicines are very heavily traded, so there are 45 million packs of medicines that leave the UK for the European Union, and 37 million packs that come the other way every month. And before 2016, they had primarily been through the Dover Short Straits. Um, in order to mitigate the risk of supply disruption, uh, of the, from the disruption that we heard about in the first session today, um, the government has worked with us to develop a multi-layered approach to managing that risk, which includes a combination of diversifying away from the short straits, so using other supply routes. It means really working on trader readiness to make sure that our businesses get the paperwork they need as quickly as possible and make sure they understand all of the rules around the border operating model. It also means stockpiling of medicines where that's uh, feasible. And so, through the variety of tactics, we are look, we are we're doing everything we possibly can to minimise the risk of disruption. Of course, not everything is within our control, though. Uh, the final thing I would just point to is, um, as we are a very heavily regulated sector, we do need information about how our regulatory framework will work as we leave uh, the European Union. We have asked for a mutual recognition agreement to make sure all sorts of standards uh, and mutual recognition of batch testing and release, which I can explain to you if you're interested, um, is consistent between the UK and the EU. Um, we still don't know whether we are going to get one, and particularly with Northern Ireland, there is a real challenge in understanding how the Northern Ireland protocol will be interpreted for medicines, and without that clarity, there may be a risk of disruption to supply in Northern Ireland. And again, we're taking all sorts of steps to mitigate the risk, the risk in the short term, but we can't rely on sort of emergency measures forever. So we really need that clarity going forward. Very finally, you referred to an Australia deal. I think the bottom line from our perspective is we are a global industry, and we've always asked for a fully 
uh, comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. That's not to say that we don't recognise the political desire for trade agreements outside of the EU, and we'll always work constructively to make the most of those. But as a global industry, we need more collaboration, fewer barriers to trade, uh, uh, not, not, the, not the opposite. So I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, as a supplementary, uh, just basically what your answer was there. You mentioned COVID uh, research, uh, and obviously we're all we're all rooting for your industry in terms of uh, your development of vaccines and, and treatments. How will that be that particular strand of work be affected if we don't get the uh, the fully comprehensive deal that you want? Well, I think the bottom line is, um, of course. COVID is a global crisis, and um, with uh, a large part of the global economy in lockdown, that has put pressure on supply chains around the world. Um, I have to say, since March, since we went into that first lockdown, supply of prescription-only medicines to the NHS has actually been very resilient for the most part. Of course, we have had some challenges in a small group of medicines that have had particularly high levels of demand because they're used in intensive care settings. Um, but we are not a just-in-time industry. We're an industry that puts an awful lot of effort into supply resilience. That being said, the last thing we need when we are uh, trying to maintain supply of medicines to every health service around the world at this time is more complication, more delay, more cost, more complexity in our supply chain into the UK. Um, so uh, it won't affect, I don't believe, the research effort as such, but it, it will put further pressure on supply chains at a time where we really don't need it. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Carter. Um, can I refer you back to my to my first question about the about the timings, whether you have the information, and what you think about the Prime Minister's comments about an Australia deal as as the best outcome at this stage? Thank you very much, convener. Members of the Scottish Parliament, good morning. Delighted to be here to answer your questions. Um, the question on preparedness is, um, um, you know, the, the key question. The question is, what are we preparing for? We are still preparing for various scenarios, and that means that um, because we don't have um, the certainty, um, our teams are working on the different scenarios, which means that we're still at a very high level. So some of our concerns, uh, they've already been mentioned by previous speakers. We're in a highly uh, regulated industry. Um, the topic of reach is of um, existential importance for the industry, and we still don't have clarity on that. Um, so we are preparing with our partners. Uh, we've done multiple workshops with our customers, uh, with our haulage uh, partners. Um, so, one of the scenarios that we're preparing for is Australian deal style. Uh, what that really means is um, WTO. So, for us, that is a, uh, a bare bones agreement, which would um, lead to us having concerns on numerous fronts. Um, the tariff discussion has already been. Um, uh, illustrated on the question, obviously, is who pays the tariff? That depends very much on industry competitiveness. Um, so, in a nutshell, uh, we're still in waiting. We're still preparing for the various scenarios. But the longer this goes on, we have less time to actually prepare for whichever scenario is agreed upon. So, we're covering our bets, so to say. Um, but obviously, the sooner we get clarity, then we can pursue um, uh, more detailed analysis to the uh, to whatever agreement is then uh, put into place. There's not very much time left. Well, in, indeed, that is that is a key point, um, and uh, we work in a highly regulated industry. Um, we import as a company about one million tonnes of chemicals into the UK a year. So the issues along the supply chain are um, of critical importance for us, and we we cannot um, exclude um, supply chain disruptions. 
OK, thanks very much. I'm sure our members will want to explore those issues uh, with both of you. Um, I'll move on quickly because I want to make sure that all members of the chance to ask their questions. So I'll move on to Claire Baker, MSP, the Vice Convener. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, in com I think in comparison to the first panel, uh, the picture painted by Mr Torbett appears to be a closer working relationship with government and perhaps a better understanding of the needs of the sector. You've talked about um, looking at the border operating model. You've talked about the stockpiling. There's a variety of tactics, I think you said, in order to try and buffer us from any problems there may be in terms of supply. So, Do you feel there is a um, desire from the UK government to achieve an alignment with the European Union over um, pharmaceuticals, recognising the importance of the sector. And if there wasn't to be an agreement, you talked about the REACH um, agreement, if that isn't the decision that's made, would there still be a need for the pharmaceutical sector to align with the EU if they wish of a regulatory framework with them, in effect, if you wish to trade with them? And how challenging would that be if you're going to look at other uh, countries to trade with? That's a really interesting question, and I, I think the first thing I would say is that obviously medicines are essential for many patients and essential for the NHS. And so I do feel that we have had a very good and deep dialogue with the UK government and indeed the Scottish government uh, since the outset of the crisis. Uh, we've had, you know, I think a good level of understanding about the challenges that our businesses face. When it comes to alignment with the European Union, the way I would describe it is that in, in, in such a complicated area, it's not really a black and white question. Um, there will be areas where the UK medicines regulator, the MHRA, may well be able to compete in terms of how it does license, the speed with which it will do licensing in certain areas. However, there are certain core elements of the regulatory framework which really ought to be global of, uh, in, in nature. And so to give you a couple of examples, the first would be around good manufacturing practice, which are the set of rules that define what good manufacturing practices look like and define the inspections that are made by regulatory authorities in uh, manufacturing plants. If we don't have a mutual recognition agreement that says, um, uh, we have the same GMP standards, then that would essentially add cost and complexity because those standards that we'd have to adhere to may, may be different, and that would incur cost in itself, but it would also lead to duplications in, in inspections. Another big one is called batch testing and release. So every batch of medicines and vaccines, when they are before they are allowed onto the market, is tested in a lab. And that is a complicated process, a very costly process. Um, if something is tested in the European Union, um, should it have to be tested again in the UK and vice versa? At this point in time, we don't yet know what the long-term relationship is going to be on batch testing and release. Now, to illustrate why we think having a mutual recognition agreement to make clear that batch testing and release and GMP inspections is harmonised, uh, to make clear why that ought to be a no-brainer. The European Union has uh, such agreements with many countries around the world, including Canada um, and even the US, um, completely outside of the context of a free trade agreement. So I think the bottom line is, you know, we, we feel a mutual recognition agreement is essential, uh, alongside the other guidance we need on Northern Ireland, um, et cetera. The UK government has included a mutual recognition agreement in its negotiating objectives for the EU. So we do feel that they've listened. We do feel that they are trying to negotiate this. Obviously, those negotiations are still ongoing. And until they are resolved, we still have a level of uncertainty. Does Mr Carter want to come in? Yes, I, I would un underscore some of those um, points. We have worked very closely with government. Um, I represent BSF on the Chemistry Council. That is the partnership between the chemical industry and mm -hmm. government. Um, so we've been working very closely with government, and uh, we have addressed our 
concerns. We also work bilaterally with DEFRA and with BASE. Um, but as the negotiations are ongoing, we have very little information on the chemical annex, which is part of the um, uh, strived for deal. Um, so the sooner that we can move on to um, seeing the, the details of that, the better, because the chemical industry is the industry of industries. So we supply strategic industries uh, in the UK, such as automotive, aerospace and uh, and pharmaceuticals now one of our one of our concerns is that um, the regulatory framework that is our primary concern because the world has um, is divided into blocks we have the the EU reach setup we have the US and we have China and um, from our point of view we want to have an aligned mutual um, agreement on reach with minimal costs for UK industry. The current draft of the UK reach um, proposal, which is going to go before Parliament, uh, would burden the industry, the chemical industry in the UK, um, with costs of up to a billion pounds. And my company, we have been very public um, uh, in terms of our position we would be uh, faced with 50 to 60 million pounds of re-registration costs um, just for BASF. And the point that we have made to the government and to stakeholders is that um, there appears to be an assumption that all chemical companies will register all their substances. Well, due to the high costs, uh, we see this as being a false assumption because the burden is uh, so significant that companies will do their own business case, their profit and loss analysis in terms of re-registering chemical substances. And this uncertainty cannot be good for our downstream um, key strategic industries for the UK, pharmaceuticals, um, we're hearing from uh, aerospace, automotive, to name just a few. Um, thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Our next questioner is Oliver Mundell. Thank you very much, uh, convener. I was interested. Um, obviously, it's quite a sort of integrated industry, um, you know, with, with, with companies on the on the continent supplying into the UK market and and vice versa, particularly um, in chemicals. I just wondered what the kind of feeling was, um, you know, in, within uh, your business. Um, in the continent, how, how are they feeling about things, and, and what pressure do you think they'll put on on uh, their, their own sort of national governments uh, to make sure that there is at least uh, you know an agreement that, that allows industry to continue on, on both sides, uh, you know, on both sides of this. I think there is a, a very clearly a mutual interest on both sides to have. Uh, an agreement on the registration of substances on UK reach because um, it's UK companies importing, exporting, it's European companies exporting to the UK. Um, so I think this is an area of common uh, interest. We work very closely with uh, SAFIC, which is the European Chemical uh, Association. We work very closely with the chemical associations in the UK, and um, we would um, underscore, and we have been underscoring the importance. The uh, the president, um, sorry, the the CEO of my company, uh, who is also the president of SAFIC, uh, has written to the Prime Minister and also to the president of the EU, underscoring uh, exactly the importance of. Um, substance registration, continuity, mutual uh, alignment and agreement. Well, that's, that's helpful. And is that the, the same within pharmaceuticals um, as well? Uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. We've been in lockstep with our colleagues in Brussels uh, and from around Europe. Uh, can I also very briefly endorse Richard Carter's comment about the uh, uh, importance of the chemical sector for our industry as well. They are the supplier for many industries throughout the economy. Uh, but on the issue of um, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, we are a global sector. We are a very highly traded global sector as well. Um, 
Uh, I issued a, a joint uh, press statement with my colleague in Brussels just a couple of weeks ago, which was reported in the FT, where we're making a very, very clear point that it is in the interests of patients, both in the UK and in the EU, that we allow that trade to continue in as smooth a way as possible. Um, and of course, beyond the short term issues, which are really primarily patients, this is about the long term competitiveness of the industry. Well, if we don't get to a point where we have a mutual recognition agreement and we end up duplicating testing, duplicating all sorts of processes, this is adding red tape as we leave, leave the European Union, not removing it. And ultimately, that is going to impact on the GDP of, of the whole region. Um, and, you know, this is at a time where the UK and the European Union is desperately trying to find R&D intensive, innovative industries to fuel economic growth and fuel recovery from the current crisis. That, that, that's uh, very helpful and, and interesting. I, I, I just wondered. I mean, we've heard you know lots of talk about these sort of low deals or side deals or uh, other bits and, and pieces. That, you know, in, in the event of a sort of worst case scenario where we don't reach an overall deal, which I, I still think we will. I think there'll be movement. Uh, at, at the last minute, um, as, as there often is in EU discussions, but you know, in, in, in this kind of you know, worst case scenario that keeps you know, getting get talked about, do you think there's still a possibility of, of having an agreement uh, on, on pharmaceuticals? And uh, you know, again, going back to uh, the other panels, just on, on chemicals as well, do you think that, that there's room for, for movement there? I mean, just perhaps on pharmaceuticals, I think, uh, firstly, I, I, uh, I appreciate and I hope I share your optimism that there'll be a deal in the end. Um, but if there's not, there is both the possibility and the precedent of at very least doing a mutual recognition agreement outside of an FTA. Like I say, the European Union has such agreements with many countries around the world um, because it really is a no brainer. No side has an economic advantage to not doing this. The only thing that will happen if we don't do it is that further cost, complexity, and delay will be put into supply chains, which will only impact patients. Yeah. Going back to uh, Mr. Graf, sorry. In terms of chemicals, do you think the same thing is likely? Well, I think the because of the strategic importance of the sector. Um, and the um, the economic benefits, uh, we would like to think that we could come to an agreement. Um, the the subject of regulatory alignment is not a topic that kicks in in terms of interrupting supply chains on day one, but this is a long term strategic element for the UK, and it impacts our global competitiveness. It impacts our productivity. And uh, we all know that the UK has various um, challenges associated with productivity. So we would like to, you know, encourage everyone to come to an agreement. And um, in terms of um, easements or grace periods that were mentioned uh, previously, um, such mechanisms can only assist because what we what we don't want is a, a last minute. Um, hastily agreed upon chemical annex that might um, uh, might oversee some some important elements. So we we remain optimistic. Um, we've made proposals to the government in terms of how this might work. Um, but one point I do want to make is that um, it's in the gift of the the UK government to minimise the costs for UK companies of re-registering. That is a UK topic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kavino. I think that's my questions up. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mundell. I'll now move on to Annabel Ewing. If Annabel is available to take her questions. Uh, Thank you, Claire. Yes, I think I lost connectivity for a, a moment. Uh, so thank you. And yes, first turning to uh, Dr. Torbett, um, a, a few questions um, uh, which I'll set out, and perhaps then it'd be easier for, for Dr. Torbett to, to seek to respond. Um, 
so picking up on uh, the possibility of uh, uh, Australia, which is a deal which is WTO, what would be the impact then, uh, likely impact in terms of the active ingredients of the compounds, which could be subject to tariffs, as far as I understand, and even if no tariffs, what what would be the position vis a vis any non tariff barriers uh, and, and how would that impact on, on the industry? Um, supply of medicines, obviously, you know, our constituents are very concerned about that, particularly those with short shelf lives and short half lives, the, the relevant pharmaceutical products, and perhaps Ms. Dr. Torbert can comment on that. And lastly, the European Medicines Agency, I mean, I understand that the UK, given we're no longer a member state, is no longer a member of the EMA, and what impact? Has that had and will that have at the end of the transition period? Thank you. Well, great questions and very well informed questions, if I may say so. So, um, I think on the first front, you're, you're quite right to say that there is a distinction in medicines between final produced medicines and intermediates like active pharmaceutical ingredient. And whilst there is no tariffs, there would be no tariffs under WTO rules for final medicines, there would be tariffs for active pharmaceutical ingredients. So where you have manufacturing industry, of which there are at least two major plants in Scotland, um, there would be a direct cost impact on those businesses that are importing active pharmaceutical ingredient from board and then exporting uh, final product or, or further intermediate product again. Um, in terms of non-tariff barriers, I mean, this is where it gets more complicated, I would say. I mean, the non-tariff barriers, uh, there are there are many. Uh, just those relating to supply would include things like um, the duplication of testing, the duplication of inspections, and so on. And that sort of thing adds time and complexity and delay in supply. Um, beyond that, though, um, you know, there are many other aspects of trade agreements which are very important for an industry like ours. Some of them relate to people, to the extent to which we can move highly qualified people around the world, participate in uh, collaborative research programs, which are usually of a, a very global nature. These sorts of things I would also characterise as non-tariff barriers in a, in a way, and would ultimately affect the long-term competitiveness uh, situation. So that, that sort of scenario of the Australia model is definitely not a scenario that is attractive to us. We are very clearly asking for global cooperation, global high standards with respect to, to, to kind of regulatory re re regime, et cetera, and, and, and fundamentally collaboration. Um, your second question about supply of medicines, um, and you, you're quite right to point to the particular difficulty of short, short life medicines as well, which is one of the examples of where um, it, stockpiling is, is and can't be the only answer. You simply can't stockpile for six weeks a medicine if the shelf life is a matter of hours or days. Uh, which is the case for a small number of med small number of medicines, but of a very critical nature. So this is why um, it really requires a, a multi-layered approach to trying to manage risk in supply. It means diversifying away from uh, the short straits as much as possible. It means taking advantage of the government secured freight. I know there was a question in the previous panel around government secured freight, and um, what I can say about that is that there is a government secured freight facility specifically for medicines, which companies will be able to book in the coming weeks uh, that will allow for a, a routine under, under those circumstances. Um, uh, so that multi-layered approach is, is, is fundamentally the kind of the, the answer that we have. It's the best answer that we've come up with, and to the best of our ability, we're doing we we're working in all of those layers to make sure we're as prepared as possible. But of course, um, not everything is within our control, which is sort of linked to your third question, implications of moving away from the EMA itself. Um, so the EMA works as a network. There are national regulators in every member state uh, and a centralized procedure for licensing. And a lot of the regulatory work in the European model had been done by uh, national regulators. And in fact, the UK's regulator, the MHRA, did a large chunk of the work, actually. They were one of the most highly respected regulators in Europe um, as part of that European system. 
So first implication is, is for Europe, of course, because obviously if they're not really drawing on the expertise of the MHRA, uh, then, then you know, that is, from our perspective, uh, unfortunate. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think we, we have an opportunity, you know, given the political reality of where we are, to think carefully about what does the future of the MHRA need to look like. And it's, I think, and some very interesting conversations are going on right now uh, with the MHRA and with um, the Office for Life Sciences uh, in, in Westminster to really think through how do we get the balance right between making sure the, the MHRA is working to international standards, but is also trying to be as smart as possible and identifying those areas where it can be at the cutting edge. Because at the end of the day, a regulator being at the cutting edge really helps the industry being at the cutting edge as well. Um, and if, if we want a world-class industry in Scotland uh, and, and in the rest of the UK, actually having that world-class regulator is very helpful to us. So um, we don't have the full picture yet, but I am optimistic that we'll find a mixed model that will probably allow uh, some level of alignment or adoption of EU approaches, um, but will also allow some flexibility for the NHRA to compete in areas that might be in the UK's interest. I hope that that good compromise will, will be something that we can all live with. Thank you for that, Dr. Dobbert. Uh, worrying and interesting in equal measure. I mean, obviously, the pharma industry is very important to Scotland. I think you're, the stats that you provided um, that uh, some 17,000 jobs uh, and exports worth 462 million uh, are entailed, and obviously we wouldn't want to see any uh, any measure, including with regard to uh, administrative bureaucracy and uh, indeed tariff costs that could um, could be a factor in whether any particular company felt it was most competitive to remain in Scotland or to be elsewhere. And we certainly wouldn't want to see any diminution of our excellent pharma industry. If I could maybe turn briefly to Mr. Carter uh, in terms of the chemical industry, and I, I had noted that um, there is a very important framework that kind of governs really, in terms of EU <laughs> membership, governs. Uh, registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals uh, via the European Chemicals Agency. And it would be helpful if, if Mr. Uh, Carter could perhaps explain what the implications of a no deal Brexit or a low deal Brexit would be for that vital framework arrangement. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This, this is our key concern because a companies uh, as part of the EU. We have already contributed and paid our costs to register uh, substances. So um, I mentioned previously that uh, a no deal would potentially put uh, a cost of one billion on the UK chemi chemical industry uh, just to re-register uh, substances. Now the re-registration does not bring about any benefit to human, animal, or environmental uh, health. So this would be a uh, a, a burdensome cost. It would reduce our productivity and it would uh, reduce our global competitiveness. Now, the, um, the, the the situation is somewhat complex because every company has a different number of substances. Um, speaking for BASF, we have over 1,000 substances that uh, we need to uh, we would need to re-register. Um, we remain optimistic that an agreement can be found, as I previously said, but the, the costs for, uh, for my company run into the tens of millions of pounds. Uh, we have made this public so that there is no um, <coughs> lack of information on the, on the impact. Um, but it also means that the UK runs the risk of becoming, um, in layman's terms, I would call it a second division player in certain global industries because if certain chemicals are no longer available in the UK, then obviously downstream um, companies, producers in key sectors uh, would potentially look elsewhere to invest uh, in the future. So we are very concerned. Uh, we're very open to all kinds of uh, cooperations, collaborations. Uh, we had proposed a 
um, a, a suggestion whereby there could be associate membership of REACH. That was under the previous government. Um, that was then uh, rejected and uh, the UK REACH proposal was uh, put on the table. So th this is our key, um, key issue right now. Um, but in the meantime, we are already having to increase our costs because we're already having to bring in additional resources to prepare for um, that worst case. So um, as previously noted, the sooner that we can get clarity on which scenario we should focus on, the better. Thank you for that answer. Mr. Carter, very, very worrying. Uh, there's 55 days go and you don't have the clarity that you need. Uh, you may, if you had followed the earlier evidence session, have heard me say that the leading trade bodies in Scotland's food and drink sector, very, very important sector for Scotland, as I'm sure you're aware, um, have actually written to the Prime Minister today seeking a six-month grace period to allow business to adapt to Brexit, taking into account in particular the impact of living through, as we have been doing for many, many months, the global pandemic and the second wave now uh, here. Um, what would be your thoughts on that, Mr Carter? Well, we find ourselves almost in, in a perfect storm. We have a global pandemic and we have um, the, uh, the subject of Brexit um, very, uh, very much in front of us. Um, any mechanisms, um, agreements that could assist uh, us in getting through to whatever model is decided on would be very, uh, very welcome. So any um, easements, grace period uh, between uh, laws coming into play on the 1st of January and actually being enacted and enforced in the UK, that would be, um, I think, a, a very much a, a common sense approach to give um, the chemical industry, but also all our downstream customers, more time uh, to uh, adapt. So um, all these measures, potential measures to limit the impact uh, would be uh, more than welcome. Um, we, al we also see that there are certain challenges on the uh, proposed UK reach in terms of registering data because we're being asked to re-register data, uh, data that in many cases we don't actually own. So uh, the, the, the complexity of submitting dossiers, preparing dossiers and the costs, um, we would uh, appeal to the UK government to reduce those UK costs associated with any re-registration to a minimal. And we would suggest to the UK government that they could actually incentivize the chemical industry to re-register all chemicals within a certain uh, time frame. So that we would take away some of the, uh, not so much short term, but the mid to long term uncertainty associated with uh, operating in the UK. Thank you, Mr. Carton. Just a very brief last question to Dr. Torbett. Just for the sake of clarity, would you e echo what Mr. Carter said in terms of an easement, a grace period, allowing your mutual recognition? Uh, arrangements to be put in place in an orderly manner? Would, would, would that be something that might be of interest to the pharma industry? Dr. Uh, I, I, I would, and I would say it's more than of interest. And it, it, for us, it is specifically for Northern Ireland, because at the point, if, even if we had regulatory clarity on how the Northern Ireland protocol will work tomorrow, it is now too late to do everything necessary to change packaging, to change routing, and all sorts of things. That would take many months to do, and the UK government knows very clearly that it's essential for us, not a nice to have. We need to have that phase in period. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart Stevenson is our next question. Uh, thank you very much, Camilla. And uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Torbert. Um, and and uh, perhaps uh, ask something I haven't heard raised so far. Uh, at the moment, there is mutual recognition of uh, patents, and I imagine in uh, pharma uh, and indeed in the chemical industry, there will be quite a lot of uh, intellectual property uh, involved in both these industries. So, uh, wh wh where is the future for uh, uh, patents, uh, pan Europe, and in particular, in effect, to uh, GB and, and of course, Scotland? 
So the particular uh, challenge that we have on patterns, um, the, the main outstanding issue relates to something called supplementary protection certificates. And what that means is it takes so many years to actually produce a medicine in the first place that the clock starts ticking on your patent. In some cases, many years before you can uh, get to market. And supplementary protection certificates essentially top up your patent um, to a level of which will you know, compensate you for that delay in coming to market. And the short version of this is that as things stand at the moment, the clock starts ticking on your supplementary protection certificate at the point of first licensing. Um, so if, you, if a company in future happens to get a license first in the European Union, and then subsequently uh, licenses in the UK, um, then the unintended consequence of that is that your patent life in the UK will be shorter than it will be in the European Union. And that is really unfortunate. It's something that we've made representations to government in Westminster about. Uh, it's a real concern and it will not send a very helpful signal um, going forward. Uh, right. Uh, thank you for that. The, the, the other one I want to ask in relation to pharma, and I, I just say my, my niece Jo, um, now a Swedish citizen post-Brexit, uh, is a, a senior research scientist and lab manager uh, near, uh, near Stockholm and has been for many years in this area. Um, clearly, the people who are involved in this are relatively well paid, but are, of course, quite mobile internationally. So, although some of the barriers won't exist in terms of people moving to and from the UK, uh, that might exist, for example, for seasonal uh, seasonal fruit pickers, um, are there in practice uh, barriers that are in the minds of research scientists or otherwise in the regulations that do now or are ex expected in future to create problems? in making sure that we are continuing to be part of the international community of research? Uh, this is a very important question. And I, I think the, the bottom, the, I think the short answer to this is that we don't yet know the full details of how it's going to work. Um, we've had some encouraging signs from the government that the uh, talent visa uh, approach, which seems to be very sensible, um, is there to try and address some of our needs to be able to move qualified scientists around. But I think it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that there has been enormous uncertainty in the scientific community generally. I think the uh, ability of universities to uh, uh, retain and attract students from other countries has been impacted. That inevitably feeds through to our companies in the future because they are the pipeline of our talent. And of course, you know exactly how the, the detail is worked out from that new visa process uh, and whether or not uh, junior staff that are developing would have the same ability to move around uh, as, as sort of seasoned scientists would do, I think remains to be seen. So it's a critical issue for us and we want as much openness and as much collaboration as we can get. Uh, and just briefly on that, is it also affecting the attitudes of the scientists themselves to whether they might be prepared uh, to move to uh, GB? I, I think absolutely it has since the referendum. I think it, I think the uncertainty has played out at a very individual level for scientists, whether in the public or private sectors, actually. Uh, and it is only getting more clarity and uh, on, on how a complete system will work, um, will we'll put people's minds at rest and allow them to prepare from a, from a personal perspective. Uh, right. Let me now move to uh, Richard uh, Carter and, and, and perhaps just try and flesh out a little more about the UK equivalent of, of, of the REACH uh, regime. Um, we, 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 we've heard something about uh, the, 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 the costs associated with that. Uh, Re-registration, 60 million uh, BASF uh, have, have, have said. But Ms. Mr. Carter, uh, what are the practical effects of, of, of this, uh, particularly if the, the, the registration process um, becomes misaligned, simply perhaps because of the timings of when things get put in the database in the UK and the database 
in, in Europe. So, Mr. Carter, are there, are there further issues associated uh, with with reach? Well, I, I think the the question of data ownership and actually being able to acquire data so as to uh, put together a, uh, a dossier as uh, as required. Um, there are uh, clear substance, uh, sorry, quantity um, tiers uh, as part of the, um, the the proposal for the uh, for UK reach. So this is challenging in terms of resources. Uh, I mentioned that we are already increasing our resources to, first of all, do the uh, analysis. And I think one of the complexities is when you have a product portfolio encompassing many thousand products, you have a, uh, a different situation per product in terms of your competitiveness, your cost situation. Um, so one of the challenges would be actually reaching out to all data owners to actually um, start any discussions on, uh, on, on data. So it, uh, highly complex associated with, uh, with resources. And that's why, uh, as I've said a few times, uh, we're looking for clarity as soon as possible um, so that we can move forward. Uh, now, BASF are uh, an international company with significant presence outside uh, the UK. Is the dynamic internally in your company, and I'm assuming this is representative of other companies in a similar position, uh, is the dynamic that it's simply easier to do certain important things outside the UK, uh, or have you got a strong argument as the managing director of the UK and Ireland uh, that says you've actually got some advantages in being outside uh, the UK because change brings opportunity as well as risk? Maybe address that last question uh, first. Uh, we have spent since the, the the referendum the BASF team on both sides um, in the UK and also in the EU. Uh, we have analysed um, everything. We have not come up with any benefits for us from leaving uh, uh, EU reach uh, because of the, uh, the the points I mentioned. Um, companies like BASF, we are uh, globally structured. Uh, we have uh, specialists in other countries. Uh, we are uh, the world's largest uh, chemical company, 120,000 people. We're headquartered in Germany. Um, so we have a lot of expertise in Germany, and we depend on the frictionless interaction uh, between countries in terms of collaboration. So anything that gets in the way or impedes our co collaboration uh, cannot be good from our point of view. Convener, I think that's uh, sufficient for the moment. Thank you very much. We now move on to questions from Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. I'd like to continue the line of questioning that I had with the previous panel around the internal UK impact of the Irish Protocol and the uh, customs, central customs border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, and First of all, just to, to ask uh, both of you what your understanding of the arrangements uh, will, will be, what, what those arrangements will be specifically for your industry, the impact they'll have on them. Uh, and I realised, uh, Dr. Torbett, you made some quite useful comments on this in your opening answer to the Wiener. So um, if, if there's anything that you wanted to expand on there, that would be very useful as well. Certainly happy to do that. Um, so. Uh, Obviously, the, the basics of the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, that the, the Northern Ireland needs to adhere to uh, European Union regulations um, are, are, are clear. And when the government published its command paper on Northern Ireland, it did note that further guidance would be available uh, forthcoming for highly regulated sectors such as ours. Now, we, whilst we have had some more guidance on this, there are still some critical pieces that are still outstanding. Uh, as we understand it, because these topics are still subject to negotiation with the European Union, and the two big areas that I would point to, um, firstly, most importantly, is around the importation rules. What sort of uh, checks and balances will the medicines have to go through, uh, particularly the movement from GB into Northern Ireland, if that makes sense. So, 
a lot of the supply or the majority of the supply, I would say, to the Northern Ireland market comes through GB. And actually, 80% of that comes through Scotland. Um, so there's a there's a Scottish angle to this, in as far as Scotland is the route through which uh, many medicines get to Northern Ireland, um, and we don't know really because of the lack of clarity on batch testing uh, released and other importation checks. We don't know how that, that's going to work. There's a second piece which is um, revol uh, involving something called the Falsified Medicines Directive, which is a European wide piece of legislation uh, that aims to uh, as the name suggests, secure the supply chain against the risk of falsified medicines. And we, uh, well, in practice, what that means is that it governs the specific type of barcode that needs to be on every single pack, and how the serial numbers connect through with European databases in order to check and track that supply as it as it moves from from place to place. Um, we don't yet know how the Falsified Medicines Directive will be applicable uh, in Northern Ireland. And as I mentioned to one of the previous uh, questions, at the point at which we do get that clarity, um, to adjust the packaging for millions of packs of medicines is obviously much more than an administrative exercise. This is a real manufacturing job, in a way, to actually change um, the what, what will be an accepted regulated pack of medicines, and, and that will take time. Thank you. And just to, to expand on that a little bit uh, more, I mean, the re relabeling is a, a good example of, of a substantial uh, administrative task and, and the other challenges that you suggest. You also mentioned things like um, batch testing. Now, if it comes to be that substantial additional lab capacity is required to, to do batch testing, for example. It, it may be the, the additional guidance that you've mentioned is eventually published. It's something that your industry is, is broadly happy with and believes can be delivered. The, the question then becomes, in the, in the short term, in that kind of best case scenario, what can be delivered for the 1st of, of January? Yeah. At, at this point, do you believe that if if the guidance that is uh, eventually published and clarified is essentially what your industry is looking for, can it actually, can everything, all the arrangements, whether it's additional lab capacity or the changes that need to be made at the manufacturer's end, can that actually be done by the 1st of January? And, and if it can, what does that disruption look like? So there are some scenarios where changes could not be made quite clearly by the 1st of January. And certainly, if a, in a scenario, which by the way wouldn't make any sense whatsoever, but if there is a scenario where a medicine would have to be tested in the EU, tested again in GB, tested again in Northern Ireland, uh, it wouldn't make any sense. But more, more importantly, those lab facilities don't exist in Northern Ireland. They simply don't exist. So if somebody decided it needed to happen, it, it couldn't. Uh, simple as that. Um, on the on the point around um, some of the other you know compliance with regulatory guidance, similarly, we have very clearly asked for a at least a twelve month phase in period, not a change to the start of the transit the end of the transition period, but we do need pragmatism and a phase in to allow time for adjustment from the point at which we've got the guidance. Because at this point, we've where we've got the guidance, we've planned for it. The issue is where we don't have the guidance, and we, we can't do what we don't um, know, uh, basically. Um, so that's that. So, so what does it mean in the short term for, for Northern Ireland? Of course, you know what I would say, and, and the first you know thing I, I have been really clear on is that this is a very serious issue that I'm talking about, and of course I'm very aware that there are patients at the end of it. So my very clear message to patients in Northern Ireland is, is please don't panic. Because I fundamentally believe that where there is a will, there is a way. There obviously has to be a will on all sides. Certainly, is a will on the industry, and there has to be the will and pragmatism from uh, the government and the EU as well. Um, there is always, at the end of the day, emergency measures that can be taken to ensure essential medicines get to patients. But of course, nobody wants to work uh, on an emergency basis uh, permanently. That's no sustainable way of of moving forward. So we really do need clarity as quick as we can. Thank you. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I probably don't manage my time very well. Mr. Carter, would you be able to, to just give a, a brief summary of the, the impact on your sector of the Irish protocol as you understand it? Um, from the BSF point of view, uh, we continue to analyse the 
um, the, the, the data that is available to us. Uh, we don't have a site, a uh, production site in Northern Ireland. We do have a production site in the Republic of Ireland, but we are looking at this. I don't think it is completely clear to everybody right now. One of the challenges that uh, we see with Northern Ireland relates to how Northern Ireland is then um, in our systems in terms of data, because um, UK is one um, one unit in our um, one geographical unit in our systems, and once we start diverging and trying to uh, separate out Northern Ireland with different uh, customs, different procedures, policies, then um, that relates to uh, increasing complexity. Um, so for for us, it's not a major issue. We are looking at it. And um, as far as the industry is concerned, I, I cannot comment, but I could certainly come back to you um, with uh, data from the chemical uh, associations. That would be great. Thanks very much. Thank you both. That was really useful. Thank you very much. We now move to Beatrice Bishop. And if I could ask questions and answers to be as succinct as possible, because we're kind of up against the clock. Thanks very much. Thank you, convener, and aware of aware of time. I'll put my question to um, both panelists, please. Um, we're aware um, uh, of the great contribution that EU nationals have made to the UK workforce, and in regard to research and development, where we know that there's around two and a half thousand EU academics have left Scottish universities. Could I ask how um, the, the loss of freedom of movement in, will affect the research and development um, and in, uh, innovation in, in your sectors, please? If I kick off very briefly, um, I think, as I mentioned to one of the previous questions, I think we are encouraged by the signals that we've had around the visa, the, the talent visa uh, policies. Uh, we're still waiting for detail on exactly how that will work in practice. And our real plea is to make sure that, you know, it, it, it is not just, you know, the, the senior staff, if I can put it that way, but really uh, many different types of kind of technical expertise are able to, to, to circulate between uh, affiliates in, in different parts of, of Europe. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Carter. Um, from the, the BSF point of view, we do not do uh, basic research in the UK, but we work very closely um, with multiple universities. We have um, over 100 partnerships with UK universities, so we are looking uh, to them. We're in dialogue with them. Um, we have our main R&D uh, community in, uh, in Germany, where we also have UK researchers based. Um, so this is a key element, but I would say we're one step uh, removed from it because uh, we work with the um, the, the institutions, universities, R and D um, groups in the UK. And it, thank you for that. And in terms of the of the wider workforce uh, in your sector, how is that how is that impacted, and and uh, and what can we do? To ensure that uh, there are there's an adequate workforce in the chemical and pharmaceuticals industry. I, I, I think I'd, I'd like to just say a few words about my personal experience. I worked um, abroad uh, in Europe uh, for over 20 years before coming back to the UK in 2016, and I think the, the the UK and the chemical industry needs to make the positive case for us being uh, an attractive place for people to come into. Um, and I think the, the question of mobility of people, I see a correlation between uncertainty and complexity. So mobility goes up, the lower the complexity. Um, so I think we all need to work on that. For us, we are dependent on people coming in, in and out almost on a daily basis. We have experts in Europe. We want them to be able to come in, maybe work on a problem at a plant or come in, work at a customer's facility as easily as possible without, um, uh, without red tape. So the, the, we're, we're watching the proposal or the uh, already announced uh, uh, visa situation. Um, we have certain sites in our UK uh, organization where we have a higher percentage of uh, colleagues from the EU. And we want them to stay. They are fundamental to our operations. Whatever 
uh, role, whatever level in the hierarchy. Um, so we really want to send positive signals, as positive as possible, that UK, our sites, our industry is a place for the future for them to work, but um, more broadly speaking, for them and their families. Thank you, Mr. Carter. That's helpful. Uh, Dr. Torbert, uh, have you any comments on the general workforce issues in relation to pharma? Uh, well, I, I just very much endorse what we've just heard. Um, but just to say, you know, it's very good that the UK and the European Union have made it clear that they're going to respect the rights of citizens in each territory. That's a good first step. But really, what we really need is that immigration system to be fleshed out and the global talent visa uh, idea. Uh, make it clear, but once it's been made clear, do a good communication job to really make sure uh, that people understand how it works. And I think getting the communication right is going to be a practical step to really think about, because at the end of the day, there are individuals and families that will want to think through the issues and they need as much clarity as possible in order to make big, dis big life decisions about where they live. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, our next questioner is Dean Lockhart. Uh, do we have to? Yes, you're back, Dean. <laughs> Thought we had lost you there. Dean. Thanks very much, Convener. Sorry, I dropped off for a second, but I'm now back. And uh, good morning to our panel. Um, regulatory harmonisation is clearly very important in, in your sectors, and you've made that very clear. After the, the transition period, uh, the, the Scottish Government is, is looking to keep pace with some or all EU regulations in the future, uh, while obviously that might not be the case in, in the rest of the UK. Um, just had a couple of questions for you on that. For, first of all, if there is regulatory divergence in your sectors uh, between Scotland and the rest of the UK market, is that a concern for you? And if the Scottish Government tries to keep pace with future EU regulations, um, will that address your concerns about uh, regulatory harmonisation with the EU? Uh, perhaps I could start uh, with Richard Torbett, please. Good morning. Well, my, my understanding is that the debate in Scotland, and please correct me, my understanding of the debate around the divergence in, in Scotland doesn't really apply to medicines, because I think that is clear that that is, operates at a UK level. Um, and. Uh, and I think, as I said before, I think when it comes to the debate between where we end up in the UK versus the EU, I, I wouldn't see it as a black or white uh, conversation, really. I know it has been portrayed as such at, at times, but I think we have got to a point where it's quite clear that there are certain areas of international standards where alignment is totally essential. But I also think there's room for a bit of creativity and a bit of flexibility there as well that can benefit the UK, including Scotland. Thank you. And Richard uh, Carter, please. Um, in, in the best case scenario, uh, there, there would be no divergence. That would be our wish, as, as I've made clear. Um, if there were to be divergence, um, I think most companies will, uh, will be maintaining alignment with the EU, because in our case, is, is our major supplier. Um, two thirds of our inbound materials come from the EU, uh, one third outbound. So I think companies will have to address their specific situations. Uh, you might be aware that BSF has uh, a production site on the beautiful island of um, Isle of Lewis. Um, so we would obviously take a very um, focused approach to any issues arising from divergence. And we would obviously uh, try and um, work out solutions if there was a need for a solution. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I'm very conscious of time, so I'd like to thank uh, the panel for those uh, responses. Yeah, th thank you all for your brevity. Uh, when I move to our last questioner, uh, Kenneth Gibson, MSP. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, panel. And uh, uh, we've heard a lot about costs this morning, and I want to just focus on that a wee bit. Um, in February last year, we had a presentation on the impact of Brexit just on one company, which was GSK. We said that it was uh, going to cost, or well, they'd spent up to that time, I should say, £70 million, and that is a company with 14,000 employees 
in the UK, so it works at about £5,000 per employee to that date. I'm just wondering what the overall cost is of um, Brexit, um, you know, in terms of preparation, um, what the impact is on the pharma industry um, uh, and, indeed, the chemical industry, if each of our panellists could um, answer that question. Perhaps Mr Carter first, actually. Yes, certainly. On, on the cost side, um, we have not uh, been able to calculate the cost to date. Um, but it has been a significant cost for uh, the management team, for the whole company. We have run literally workshops with hundreds of our customers. So there is very clearly a, a cumul uh, accumulated cost there that um, is uh, very difficult to actually uh, quantify. I think the, the, the cost picture becomes a, a lot clearer when we look to the future because um, if we take the subject of tariffs, on average, for the chemical industry, tariffs, let's say, in the region between 5 and 7 percent, for my company, BASF, we estimate um, the tariff mm -hmm. impact to be £50 million pounds per anno. So if you add up the tariff impact, you add up the, um, the the, the cost of having to employ additional people, which we are, are doing in certain areas of supply chain, um, these are very tangible costs going, going forward. Um, like I said, I can't give a cost uh, accumulated to date, uh, but, but it's been a significant time cost. Uh, going forward, those costs uh, are in a very different dimension. And because of the dimension of these costs, um, I think a lot of companies will reevaluate their activities. Now, global companies, um, for example, BASF, we're in a different position because of the resources we have at our disposal. I think we need to put focus, and this is an industry point that came out of the uh, chemi uh, Chemistry Council meeting recently with government, is that SMEs need more support from their partners and maybe also from government uh, agencies to ensure their preparedness. Thank you. Dr. Torbett? The figures that you have from GSK there give you a sense of the order of magnitude. Um, I believe one of the other companies went public with a figure of around 100 million. I have to say uh, our early attempt to try and quantify this for the whole sector proved enormously complicated, and actually, I'm not confident giving you a reliable figure for the whole sector. Uh, frankly, we put our efforts more into actually planning for uh, Brexit and, and obviously dealing with COVID in, in, in recent months. Um, but I think the figures you get give you a, I, I, what I would say a, a, an order of magnitude for the immediate administrative costs of this. I think it's also worth not losing sight of the bigger picture of opportunity costs to the economy if we get some of the decisions that need to be made soon wrong. So if we don't have a mutual recognition agreement, for example, and we end up duplicating all these processes that I've been talking about this morning, that will affect the competitiveness of the overall UK, uh, European region, including the UK. That will lead to a big opportunity cost in terms of the investment that could come here and the jobs that could come here and the R&D that could come here, and that would be a far bigger figure. I mean, Dr. Torbett, that was the issue I was about to focus on next, the impact on inward investment or indeed indigenous investment and in product development. I'm just, I mean, obviously, if a company like GSK spent £70 million, that was just up to February of last year, one company, um, you know, um, that's money that's not going into product development or innovation, R&D or anything else. I'm just wondering how that will impact, how this entire um, process will impact on the on the the pharmaceutical industry in Scotland and indeed the UK, I mean, in terms of getting it back, in terms of its, its growth potential, how do you feel that that is um, going to affect it, this scenario? So, no, I, I think, I think you're, you're quite right. Um, uh, money spent duplicating all of these things is money that is not spent on more productive uh, work, like developing medicines, running clinical trials, uh, putting money into discovery science and so on, which is what we really want to be focusing on, particularly here in the UK, which has been one of the homes of the pharmaceutical industry actually for many decades. Um, I think it's worth saying that, um, you know, I, I am, as a representative of the ABPI, 
uh, I obviously have to be working with the, the real difficulties of managing this transition. Like I say, lots and lots of work to work through. But equally, you know, we are committed to the UK and we're committed to working whatever the political reality is to make the best of it. And I think there are ways in which we can make the best of whatever situation we're in. We've got good news stories. We've had two companies make major investments in the UK in the last few months or announce investments in the last few months, which is quite encouraging. So there will always be a reason to come here alongside uh, the economic activity that we might lose. And my job in partnership with uh, uh, politicians in Scotland, politicians in, in Westminster, is obviously to make the UK the most attractive place we can make it. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone would want to agree with that. Absolutely, you know, we have to do, make the best of whatever situation uh, we're in. Just wish we weren't in such a difficult situation. I'm sure. I mean, one of the the other things that I was wanting to mention to you, um, uh, Dr. Torbett, um, um, Mr. Carter actually mentioned that uh, BESF was um, perhaps having to spend fifty, sixty million pounds on re-registering its products. So, what, what's the situation in terms of the uh, pharmaceutical industry? Because, of course, many medicines are quite specialised and um, uh, they may be un uncompetitive in terms of a return for the, at the specific company if we do not have European wide registration, because they may only have so few patients who may require these necessarily very important medicines. But it may be a di difficulty in terms of the of the, the company itself uh, still being able to market with re-registration costs. So I'm just wondering. You know, if, if the, 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 there are any discussions going on with the UK government about potential subsidies, yes. if this matter is not resolved, so I think you're quite right to point to this as a risk. I would see it probably more in the generic medicine space than the branded pharmaceutical market. Although, where I have had concerns raised with me, it has again been in Northern Ireland rather than in GB as such, because it is a much smaller market. And you know, if there are including generic medicines that may uh, cease to be profitable in Northern Ireland, that will have a knock-on consequence as physicians look for substitute products, which may knock on to the supply chain in in the branded market as well. And that's at a time where supply chains are under a lot of stress. So I, I think we haven't had com we haven't had conversations about subsidies. Um, I don't know whether the generics industry has, um, but it is something that we are looking at very closely. And just one final question, if I may convene up to um, Mr. Carter, and that's actually with regard to where we are uh, in terms of trying to resolve these issues in, in terms of the chemical industry. Mr. Torbett can perhaps comment uh, subsequently on the farm industry. But how confident are you that there are the, these issues, which the industry currently faces, the chemical industry, uh, Mr. Carter, um, will be resolved prior to the 31st of um, December, or is this likely to rumble on for a number of months into the new year? I know there's a kind of all right on the night attitude um, being put forward by some individuals, but in practical terms, how confident are you that we'll be able to have this sorted? Well, I think the the the, the chemicals annex is dependent on the overarching uh, ag agreement between the UK government and. The EU. So, uh, I would like to hope that as soon as the the big stumbling blocks uh, in these negotiations are agreed upon, that both sides could then move rapidly um, to work on the chemical annex and to become a lot more specific in terms of what uh, what needs to be addressed uh, in the industry. Um, ideally, um, a mechanism, uh, an agreement, would lead to mutual recognition, uh, reduce cost, um, zero cost for re-registration would be our strong desire. Um, so I think this follows on from whatever deal is reached. Um, obviously, if things do not uh, get settled very quickly, then uh, I, I think realistically speaking, um, this will then be a topic that will uh, flow into next year and to make sure that we get the right deal rather than just a quick deal um, on chemicals registration. So it really depends, is, is my answer. And I'm sorry, um, I can't be more specific. Right. Dr. Torbert? Where we know what we've had to plan for, 
uh, our businesses have absolutely done the work, but there's outstanding guidance that we can't plan for. European negotiations have a habit of concluding at one minute to midnight. Businesses can't plan on that basis. At the point where the guidance is published, we need time to, to do it. So there needs to be pragmatism. We need that phase-in period, particularly for Northern Ireland. Thank you, um, Dr. Torbett. Thank you, Mr. Captain. Thank you, convener. Thank you, thank you very much. And can I also extend my thanks to Dr. Torbett and to Richard Carter uh, for a very interesting evidence session today. And uh, I will now close uh, this session of the committee, and we shall move into private session. Thank you very much.